Well, hello again. I'm Dan Skipani, the current board president of the International Association uh, for Spiritual Care. And it's on behalf of our board and our local team here at our Anabaptist uh, Seminary in Northern Indiana that I welcome you to the 2024 online symposium, Practical Theologies, Wisdom, Traditions, and Spiritual Care. Our gathering is co-sponsored by the Society for the Intercultural and Interreligious Pastoral Care and Counseling, whose president, Dr. Dominique Lutens, will moderate our sessions tomorrow. This is the first time we can uh, collaborate this way. We are very happy for that opportunity. Our focus is to explore the question of how our wisdom traditions, spiritual, religious, philosophical, theological, intersect with the much younger wisdoms in the social and behavioral sciences, especially the psychotherapeutic psychologies across cultures and disciplines. Together with that focus and goal, we wish to encourage further conversation and collaboration in the days ahead. Now, as you know, symposia come in different formats. We chose to maximize input this time. That is substantive content from 13 representatives of those traditions. Therefore, we cannot have direct interaction between presenters and registrants. Now, there, are, there will be breakout rooms with small groups chosen at random, with, which will give the opportunity to share main insights drawn from the presenters and possible main questions as well you will have the opportunity to register those questions or concerns in the chat and presenters will receive them. They will actually take them into consideration even after the symposium as they prepare essays for a major publication that we visualize for next year. All sessions will be recorded and you will be able, uh, it will be available to you on our web and our uh, Facebook. Now, I'm very glad to introduce the two speakers representing the rich Hindu tradition. Uh, Dr. Vinit Chander is the assistant dean for Hindu life and Hindu chaplain at Princeton University, and also serves as a religious life advisor at the Lawrenceville School. He's the nation's first full-time Hindu chaplain and program director in higher education. Uh, Vinit is a co-founder of the North American Hindu Chaplains Association, and he's the co-author author of two academic volumes on Hindu chaplaincy and numerous articles on related topics. Um, there is more to the bio that you already have or, or you can read uh, for the sake of saving time. In this case and in all the other cases, our presenters uh, have outstanding um, credentials. I'll be brief. The other presenter, uh, the Hindu tradition, is the is Dr. Kavita Palod Sexaria. She's a clinical psychologist in private practice, focused on providing psychotherapeutic services to the South Asian community. Uh, Dr. Cesaria is particularly dedicated to destigmatizing spiritual means for coping in the therapeutic space. She also serves on Hindu American Foundation Board of Directors, supporting the organization's education and advocacy mission. 
So let's listen to our colleagues. One will follow the other. After uh, and after that time, we'll have a chance to uh, uh, reflect for a few minutes on their input. Dinet, you are in. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, begin my presentation. I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. Okay, and is that is that visible to everyone? Yes. Okay. Very good. Well, thank you so much. It's such an honor to to be here uh, and to share uh, some insights to kick off our conversation and perhaps to raise some of the questions and themes that we will continue to explore together. Um, it's especially uh, an honor, but also a little daunting to be the first presentation in that um, you know, there, there are many uh, vantage points and many ways that we could approach our topic today. And I think that's very much in the spirit of this conference uh, is the idea that we all kind of approach similar, um, we, we approach the work uh, from where we stand and from where we are. And so um, in that sense, we bring to the work really our own contexts and our, our own um, our own our own uh, personhood. I want to begin, as I often do, um, with an invocation prayer in my tradition. This is called a mangal acharana, or an, in, an auspicious invocation. Uh, and here, I specifically specifically have chosen this one because I feel that it, it actually hits on much of what we will be discussing. So I want to invite you into a space of reflection, into a space of prayer, if that's a part of your theology, uh, into a space of presence as, uh, I, as I recite this very short uh, but powerful invocation. Om Sarvesham Swastir Bhavatu Om Shanti 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 Sarvesham Swasti Bhavatu. It's interesting, there's, there's, there are three relatively simple Sanskrit words here that we can unpack, but I think these three words uh, really position us for so much of our exploration together today and throughout the course of this conference. Sarvesham. The, the mantra begins with um, this word that connotes uh, all beings, all of creation. And so it's a reminder, I think, that the work that we speak of is work that calls us to push boundaries. Um, what does it mean to be a giver of care to the specific communities and the specific individuals that we may be working with? What does it mean to be a caregiver to the person in front of us or the individual uh, who is the recipient of our care in the most literal sense of that term. Um, but what does it also mean to challenge that notion that we are caregivers to individuals and instead to also embrace simultaneously the idea that care should and, and perhaps even must extend beyond limitation. Um, and so here, sarvesham is a, is a word that connotes this beyond limitation. Um, to all beings, all sentient beings, as is often said in, in Eastern traditions. And then we have this word swasti, which in, in one sense, uh, I think, is the kind of the heart. I won't say meat and potatoes because I'm a vegan, so I, I don't like that uh, expression so much, but uh, is perhaps this, the heart, the centerpiece of, of what wisdom traditions, but also what uh, traditions and modalities of therapeutic care are aiming at, this idea of wellness, of well-being. Um, 
And in the context of Hindu wisdom tradition, uh, Swasti, by its very definition, calls us to look at wellness not only in terms of, as we'll unpack a little bit more, but not only in terms of health as we're used to thinking of it, but Swasti as a, as a state, as an existential state of contentment, of auspiciousness. So this is wellness on perhaps a level that seeks to integrate the physical, the mental and emotional, but also the spiritual or transcendent, which I think will be a theme that we'll see more of. And then Bhavatu, may there be. Um, it's, this is an invocation. And, and as with any invocation, it is a, um, a reminder to us, perhaps a humbling reminder that ultimately we are seeking higher power to make it be so. But the power to, to um, manifest well-being or contentment for all beings is not only in my hands, that I may have play a role in that, but ultimately I am looking towards a higher power, whether we understand that higher power as divinity, God, goddess, the universe, um, whatever it may be, but there is a recognition that there is a force beyond me that, um, that is responsible for that manifestation of wellness and that I am but an instrument in that. Uh, so in the spirit of contextualization, as, um, as Daniel shared in that, in that gracious introduction, and as you all can see in the bio, um, I have the, the, the great fortune of having served as the first uh, Hindu chaplain, full-time Hindu chaplain in higher education. And so when I arrived uh, back in 2008 at uh, my home institution, Princeton University, uh, it was... It was quite uh, newsworthy in some ways. So you can see there, uh, I made the cover of the Daily Princetonian, our student newspaper, um, second only to the tantalizing story of the university store offering more food. So um, the fact that the university store was now stocking multiple flavors of Doritos was was the real big news. But I was a close second. Uh, my my arrival and the arrival of I can't see people's faces, so I hope that joke landed. Um, but my, that my arrival and the arrival of my, my Muslim colleague, um, Imam Soheb Sultan, uh, this was, was pretty big news here at Princeton and in the case of the Hindu community um, nationwide. And that's terribly exciting, but it was also quite terrifying because uh, there was no blueprint to follow, so to speak. And in fact, I, I recall one of my um, mentors and my direct supervisor, uh, one of our associate deans here at the time, the Reverend Paul Rauschenbusch, um, he specifically told me that a big part of the job was um, to write the job description for myself and for generations to come. Uh, and I reflected on that, and I, and I, I, I share that by way of introducing um, where the rest of this presentation is going, and that is um, in, in trying to to articulate what is the approach of a Hindu chaplain specifically, um, someone drawing from Hindu tradition, um, someone drawing from Hindu wisdom tradition uh, in approaching this, this call or this mission uh, towards holding others in spiritual care. Um, and and, and I, I understood uh, Paul's um, uh, recommendation or, or, or challenge to me in two ways. I did see it as a challenge. Um, and I recognized uh, that, that part of the challenge is that as much as we do talk about multi-faith spiritual caregiving, we are still largely speaking of that caregiving in the context of Christian normativity. And so um, higher ed chaplaincy and other forms of chaplaincy are very much still defined by kind of Protestant Christian norms. Um, and I say that not to cast blame or, or to try to shame anyone or any particular tradition. In fact, I say that with, uh, I, I hope, really genuine gratitude for a lot of the work that, that has already been done and a lot of the foundations that have been built that, um, that, that I benefit from. And at the same time, I recognize that there's a challenge there, that it's so easy to fall into um, simply trying to offer a, a Hinduized version of 
um, essentially Christian frameworks of pastoral care that draw from and are authentic to Christian, Protestant Christian in particular wisdom teachings and traditions, um, but that may not authentically resonate or authentically reflect um, my own tradition. And so embedded into the challenge, I also saw and continue to see opportunity, opportunity for true renewal, rebirth, and reimagination of our field. Um, that we often do, uh, those of us who are engaged in, in, in the, the work, the vocation of spiritual caregiving, we find ourselves often at, in these liminal spaces and in these intersections, um, grappling with and, and holding dynamic tension with tradition on the one hand, but with innovation and evolution and growth on the other. Um, in many ways, and, and it's a larger conversation which we can't do justice to, but in many ways, I do um, want to suggest that the work of a chaplain is very much the work of a constructive theologian, that we are called to be constructive theologians, um, and that and and, and that is a, a dimension of, of what we're doing. We're actually constructing and reconstructing our own theologies. In that spirit, I want to offer in the rest of our time together um, as a way of thinking about uh, a Hindu approach to spiritual caregiving, um, drawing from Hindu wisdom traditions, uh, two metaphors or analogies uh, that invoke the imagery of chariots. Um, the first is one that I like to call the chariot of the self or the chariot of the embodied self. And um, this is a, uh, a metaphor or an analogy that I have drawn from a Hindu text, a venerable Hindu wisdom text known as the Katha Upanishad, one of the uh, 108 principal Upanishads or extant Up Upanishads. This is a body of wisdom texts. Um, that are among the oldest texts of, of what we today know as uh, con the contemporary tradition of Hinduism. Um, and this is a very powerful analogy. And then the second uh, analogy draws from the wisdom text, the Bhagavad Gita. So beginning with the chariot of the self. The chariot of the self um, really invites us to look at a framework that speaks of wellness and illness, but perhaps of, that speaks of it in a way that differs from, and I hope complements, but maybe even challenges some of our contemporary notions of wellness and illness, particularly those notions that with due respect uh, to the um, psychotherapy side of the house, so to speak, but so much of the way we look at wellness and illness, I think draws from, um, medical interve in intervention and um, uh, psychological intervention frameworks. And so this framework really um, suggests or asserts that, that wellness, we can look at wellness on a deeper level as being existential. That real wellness is a recognition of our core um, eternal identity as spiritual beings. And in that sense, uh, and I want to be careful about the language here because it can so often be misunderstood or misused, and this is something that perhaps Kavita and I will, will get to, to share in, in conversation a little bit later today, um, but it can, be, it can be misunderstood, so I want to be careful. But this framework suggests that if wellness is a recognition of our divine, eternal uh, spirit, spiritual identity or spirithood, then illness, in fact, is a misidentification with the material world and with our body-mind complex as part of that material reality. In other words, illness in this framework forgets who we really are or causes us to forget who we really are and instead to accept an illusory identity that misidentifies us and that identifies us so strongly with the body-mind complex now, as embodied beings, we do have bodies and minds, and, and we'll get into that in, in just a moment. But in this framework, illness is, is such a, a, a misidentification with the body-mind complex that in one sense it eclipses or it causes us to forget the deeper reality that at core we are actually neither the body nor the, the, the mind and the emotions uh, or anything else connected to them, but we are actually spiritual beings who can witness the body and mind. 
Um, and as part of that illness, we forgetting our core spiritual nature, which itself houses or, or holds the key to our, our contentment, we relentlessly pursue that contentment, that happiness in external objects and in, and in externalizing our experiences, objectifying relationships, externalizing our experiences. And this ultimately re results in a kind of existential alienation, frustration, and suffering, which um, Eastern traditions uh, across the board um, often speak of as a sort of the fundamental problem. And, and, and that's encapsulated in a Sanskrit word, uh, dukkha, which some of you may be familiar with. Now, I said this was an analogy, and so this text of Katha Upanishad offers us a very visual um, analogy of the chariot that helps us to really um, make sense of what it means to be an embodied being. Uh, and so I wanted to sort of take a, a little bit of time just to unpack this analogy together uh, so that we could look at what is being suggested here. And so the analogy asks us to imagine the embodied self as a chariot that is hitched to five horses. Um, this particular image, uh, by the way, let's just imagine a generic chariot. So if you're familiar with Indian iconography, don't worry about sort of particular persons right now. Um, imagine a ger generic chariot that is, um, that is connected to five horses. In the classical analogy, um, there are five constituent pieces to the analogy that represent the five constituent um, components of what it means to be an embodied self in the material world. Usually the analogy begins by identifying the first and in one sense most sort of physically concrete and tangible as the physical body itself. And this, the analogy says, is uh, like the physical, the, the vehicle of the chariot, right? So many wisdom traditions speak about the body as a vehicle. So in, in this wisdom tradition as well, we have the chariot as representing the physical body. But how does this physical body move around in the world, if you will, the world of, of external objects? Um, well, the, the vehicle is no good without something to drive it and, and cause it to move. And here we come to the five senses which, no coincidence, are represented visually in the analogy as five horses. And so where do these senses take us? Well, they take us in multiple directions, but when they're channeled, they are able to propel us forward and help us to move around in the world. And so what is that force by which the horses, the senses, can be guided? And here, we're going to use a little bit of Sanskrit terminology, but I'll, I'll, I'll offer... Um, and English translation. There are multiple ways of translating these words. Um, but the word that's, that is used in the original text and, and, and the original analogy is manas. And the translation I'd like to use for manas is that manas is the reactive mind. So the reactive mind is that part of our mental makeup that is closest to our senses and is that sort of communication point between the senses and the rest of the embodied self. Um, and it's the reactive mind, why? Because it's so closely connected to the senses that it really is almost like an extension of the senses. And so if we can imagine um, a dog with a leash, I'm gonna twist the analogy a little bit, but if we can imagine a dog with a leash, right? That leash is connected to the dog and so wherever the dog goes or pulls, that leash is gonna follow, right? Um, unless there's someone holding on to the leash. And so um, we come to the fourth part of the analogy, which is the charioteer, the chariot driver who holds on to and uses those reins. And that is the buddhi, or what I translate as the discerning mind. So both the reins and the charioteer in this analogy represent the mind, as we might call it in the West, but here the analogy splits it into two parts and says, essentially, when we talk about the mind, we're really talking about the act of the discerning mind guiding the reactive mind, the way that a, a good charioteer, or in my more modern version of the analogy, a good dog walker, um, knows how to 
work the leash, knows when to give it slack and when to tighten it in order to guide that animal, in this case, uh, the, the horses, um, in the right direction and to steer those horses away from danger. And so also this analogy explains that what is so key to our healthy functioning in the journey of life that this analogy really kind of points at is the charioteer um, very with discernment and intentionality guiding the reactive mind so that the reactive mind can in turn constructively engage and guide the senses. Now there's a fifth part of the analogy and, and in one sense it's the most important and that is the embodied self itself or in other words the spiritual component that we might call the true self or the soul and that in Sanskrit is, is, is known as the Atma or Atman. Um, here, the Atman is the passenger. Why? Not that the, the Atman is um, passive in the sense that we might think of that term, but the, the passenger essentially engages. So if we think about taking an Uber ride or a taxi ride, right? Um, we are going on the journey and we're, we're, we sort of outsourced the whole thing to an Uber driver in hopefully a... Um, you know, a, a properly functioning car or vehicle, right? And so also the soul or the true self is the one kind of engaging in the journey, witnessing the journey um, and relying on the discerning mind to guide the chariot of the body, the reactive mind and the senses to all do their part. Um, now, what does this, this very um, brief look at this analogy tell us? Well, it tells us, I think, a couple of things. One is that, um, that there is a right alignment to things. And we can take inventory of our own sort of the, the components that make us up as people and identify whether we are in alignment. In other words, is our discerning mind, is that discerning part of us um, actually doing its, its work in guiding the reactive mind um, so that we are constructively engaging in this world? Or do we so often feel like the, 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 the horses of the senses are running wild and the sort of the mind is trailing behind, right? Um, it offers us an opportunity to check in about how aligned or misaligned we might be in terms of this, this functioning of these constituent parts. Um, a second way we can, we can learn from this analogy is that just as the passenger is meant to witness, we, all, we also, as the, the self within that is distinct from the body, that is distinct from the senses, that is distinct from the reactive and even the discerning mind, we can learn to quiet the mind and to witness the mind. Um, this is where contemplative practice comes in, to allow us to tune into that inner dialogue so we can check in on what is the relationship between that more reactive part of the mind and the more discerning or guiding part of the mind. And this, in turn, can help us to cultivate what, what I would call a healthy sense of non-attachment, um, cultivating a healthy sense of separating from the body-mind complex enough to know how to care for it, right? Sometimes we think of separating from the, 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 the body-mind complex as something that might be, um, that might be a kind of a, a, a dysfunction or a detachment, right? And becoming sort of apathetic or indifferent. But here I wanna suggest that there's also the possibility of a healthy form of non-attachment that, that allows us to say, I am not the body, although I have this body and I'm, 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 it's a part of who I am, I'm not entirely the body, I'm not entirely the mind, and therefore I am someone that can take a step back, that can witness it, and that can recognize that there is a need to care for it, right? Um, and this in turn allows us to facilitate wellness. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail here, but there is a framework of facilitating um, wellness that I have found incredibly, incredibly meaningful in my own work that takes this approach and that says, if I can step back and witness the relationship between the body, the senses, the discerning mind and the reactive mind, then I can facilitate wellness by 
intentionally um, locking in on cultivating a practice of self-discipline, being intentional and purposeful about my choices, really, really looking at what we might think of as the behavioral realm, right? What, what do I do? What interventions can I, can I rely on or create for myself um, to be intentional about that alignment? Um, I can also engage in contemplative practice to help me to be more self-aware and more kind of um, clued in or tuned in to that inner dialogue. And this, I would say, um, is a, the Sanskrit term is Swadhyaya. I would say this relates much more to the cognitive realm. And then finally, there is this idea of Ishvara Pranidhana, of relationship with divinity, that um, in the classical analogy, that chariot journey is the journey of the self towards the divine. And so um, through this recognition of these constituent parts, I can re-vision my relationship as the embodied self with my divine source. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail, but I found this incredibly helpful in my work as a college chaplain, for instance, in working with students to help them to reflect on and be intentional about, and sometimes to even sit down with them and co-create um, plans of action for how they're going to engage with things like their academic, the pressures of the, their academic work or how they wish to engage with or not engage with um, certain high pressure situations on campus, like the party culture or um, patterns of um, healthier and less healthy uh, engagement with um, sexuality and, and with their sexual practices. Um, that I would consider very much part of tapas or the behavioral realm. Looking at Svadhyaya, helping students to really reflect on and engage in their own contemplative life. What, is their, what do their contemplative practices look like? And then Ishvara Pranidhana, what does their inner life of devotion and their relationship with divinity, however they may understand it in the multifaceted ways that they understand it, what might that look like in terms of worship, in terms of um, quiet devotional time, in terms of whatever devotional practices may be for them? Um, I found complementary frameworks in both Buddhist and Christian models, including uh, a model suggested by, by Daniel. So I'm, I'm honored to be able to uh, cite to some of the work that I found incredibly helpful in my own um, that, that Daniel and, and, and others perhaps on this call were, were a part of. Um, so I think I'm suggesting something that I've found within my own tradition, but that, co that complements um, similar sort of frameworks that look at these three components in other traditions. Now, just rounding out and concluding, um, I want to also say, I want to also talk a little bit about um, a second way that I engage with this idea of chaplain, of, of the, the, the uh, chariot as being a fitting metaphor or analogy for chaplaincy. And this one draws from the devotional text, the Bhagavad Gita. Now, in the Bhagavad Gita, divinity himself, uh, in, in this form of Sri Krishna, um, is takes the role of the charioteer of his friend and devotee, the warrior Arjuna. And we find the, 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 the context for this dialogue that the text makes up is uh, a battle that is about to take place in which Arjuna is going to have to face his enemies who, because this, the, the, the larger context of the story is that this is a war that is dividing um, one dynasty and one family that is ripping apart a family. And so Arjuna is going to have to face on the other side of this battle, um, his near and dear ones, people that are his, his own family members and teachers and loved ones. And so in, an, in a verse, in the, the first chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, we find Krishna, the charioteer, bringing Arjuna's chariot. Arjuna says, bring my chariot. I want to see who is assembled before me on this battlefield. And Krishna brings Arjuna's chariot and the verse describes, uh, I'll just read the English here, that bringing Arjuna face to face with Bhishma and Drona, the Lord then spoke to him and said, just behold, Partha, all of these, these warriors, the, the members of the Kuru dynasty that have assembled here. Now, it's, it's really interesting. This verse speaks of 
Krishna bringing Arjuna face to face with Bhishma and Drona. Who are Bhishma and Drona? Bhishma and Drona are Arjuna's beloved grandfather and beloved teacher or guru, respectively. And something that you need to know for this to make sense is that Bhishma and Drona were the two people, probably more than anyone else on that battlefield, who Arjuna loved and respected the most. And by force of circumstance, tragically, they're on the other side. They've sided with these, the villains, uh, so to speak. Um, and now Arjuna is, has no choice but to face them in battle, right? And so Arjuna's heart is going to break. And Arjuna himself is going to break down. And Arjuna's breakdown is what actually opens the door to the rest of this wisdom text taking place. And what I want to suggest then is that even in the first chapter of the Gita, what is the Gita telling us? Situating Krishna as the divine and as the teacher, the wisdom teacher of the text. Situating him as the charioteer, the charioteer who drives Arjuna's chariot to, in one sense, the very last place that he wants to go, right? Uh, face to face with the, the very last two people that he wants to have to confront, right? Arjuna wanted to believe, he wanted to pretend that Bhishma and Drona weren't there. And it would have been so much easier in one sense, so much superficially kinder for Krishna to have drawn Arjuna's chariot in front of some anonymous, impersonal warriors on the other side that Arjuna didn't know by name and by face and didn't have a, a prior relationship with. No, but Krishna, the, char the expert charioteer, knew that Arjuna had to confront what was at the root of his heartache in order to go deeper and to, to go through rather than around his existential crisis. And so also, I want to suggest that this analogy of the chaplain as charioteer calls us to see the charioteer not as a problem solver or fixer, but as one who facilitates an experience, as one who brings the recipient of care to wherever they need to be in that moment, however difficult or painful or confronting it might need to be. Um, and here I'm really inspired by the idea of the chaplain as one who is, as one of uh, my mentors uh, and someone I look up to, Sharon Dallows Park says, uh, is the simultaneous and paradoxical nurture challenger figure, that a spiritual caregiver has to, by definition, um, be a kind of a mentor figure that is simultaneously a nurturer and one who gives care, but also challenges the recipient of care in the way that they need. Um, this is also a decentered form of care and of empathy. This is not the model of the chaplain as the savior, as the fixer, as one who is um, an external source of the solution, um, but rather as an instrument of care. And here I feel a lot of resonance with a lot of the wisdom that I've gotten. I know we're gonna hear from Buddhist spiritual caregivers um, and, and teachers. And I've gotten a lot of, I, I find a lot of resonance with uh, the great work that's been done in the field of Buddhist chaplaincy, envisioning the chaplain or the caregiver as one who is a facilitator, an instrument of care, one who um, creates enough wind that the clouds can be removed and clarity can rise for what it, what it is. Um, that such a chaplain is a true companion and guide. And I love that in Hindu wisdom traditions, the word that's most often used for guidance is marga darshan, which literally means um, the showing of the marg, of the path, right? So real guidance is not that I walk that path for you. Real guidance is I help to illuminate perhaps a little bit of the path for you so that I can accompany you on the journey that you need to take on that path. The Gita ends in this spirit, um, just as it began in the spirit of Krishna as the charioteer playing that decentered, facilitating, and yet challenging role, um, that role of helping Arjuna to, to confront and, and facilitating Arjuna's confronting what he needs to confront. So it's a very active role, but it's ultimately a role of a facilitator or an instrument of care, one who shows the path. I think it, it's nicely bookended by the end of the Gita, 
in which Krishna actually returns to that role of facilitator and says to Arjuna, I have explained to you, I've shared with you the knowledge, the insights. Um, I've gone as deep as, as I wish to go with you um, and as you could hear. And now the proverbial ball is back in your court. Now reflect on this and exercise your choice, your agency, do ichati, um, do as you wish to do. And so in that same spirit, I'd like to bring this sharing of some insights or the sharing of these, these models of chariot uh, chaplaincy to a close, inviting your reflections uh, and your questions and your further discussion as we engage with and perhaps even push back on some of these notions uh, and insights. So thank you so much. Thank you, Vinay, for this uh, wonderful presentation <clears throat> um, on Hindu anthropology and the way you help us look at spiritual care, if I may say, as the art, the sacred art of charioteering, <laughs> um, and the way you have explained. Um, thank you so much. Um, Later on in the chat room, there will be a chance to uh, reflect a little bit, even if, if briefly, and perhaps um, hear some some questions and that may be raised. Um, we have a second Hindu voice um, this morning, afternoon, uh, Dr. Kavita Saksarya, <clears throat> and. Um, so we'll be ready to listen to you, Kavita, as soon as you are you are ready. Uh, okay. And to unmute yourself and hi. I um, am just trying to get Zoom to share my presentation, which I thought I tested out, and now it seems to be angry at me. Um, so I apologize truly for the um, delay. So hopefully. Yes, here we go. Uh, can you see my screen, everyone? I know it's not presenting. But I think hopefully this should be working now. Uh, hi, everyone. I do apologize uh, for that delay, but I'm Dr. Kavitha Plodzaksaria, and I'm here to um, add a layer of my understanding as both a Hindu and a psychologist to what it means to integrate spiritual care. So I'm a second generation Hindu Indian American and um, as Daniel so uh, warmly introduced me, I'm a board member for the Hindu American Foundation as well, which is all to say that I'm very grounded in my Hindu identity and the way that a lot of I think second generation Hindu Americans are where we don't go to our house of worship often. We have not read much scripture, but we've really internalized a lot of these ideas and how we see the world and how we interact with it. And so given that, I was really proud to go to grad school, um, grounded in my experience as uh, the daughter of immigrants and feeling like there was a gap a lot of times in my community of being able to access um, a lot of the care that could have um, prevented a lot of suffering that I saw. Um, so I wrote my dissertation on Hindu Indian conceptions of mental health with the hope of better understanding um, what our wisdom traditions had to say about mental health and how to 
help people see that there was nothing about especially psychological services that was antithetical to that and try to start to build a bridge and really being able to understand chaplaincy and the role it plays also in the um, kind of framework of care uh, has been really, really illuminating. I'm in private practice myself now, um, which has been lovely because it's allowed me to work with a lot of Hindu Indian American clients, I would say, between 70 and 80% of my caseload identify as such, but there is a lot of diversity. And I think the thing that I'm proudest of is that I seem to have attracted a lot of even Muslim, Catholic, a Cherokee client who, um, feel that the space that I'm, I hope to create as a psychologist will give them the space to explore and understand how their relationship to their faith is a part of their healing as well as their growth. Um, it's entirely virtual, and I thought it was interesting uh, to be asked to reflect on some of the both challenges and opportunities of the work that I'm doing myself. Um, I think this has long been true that there are systemic challenges. I daily feel guilt about being in private practice and the acknowledgement of the barrier that puts up to access while also really being grateful that it lets me craft the practice that I want to. So there are problems with uh, systems and reach that are tough on a daily basis to grapple with. And I imagine um, there's kind of overlaps and differences too uh, when we talk about how spiritual care um, operates and in terms of the opportunities I really like to say that I think um, a lot of times uh, premarital work has been very much rooted in religious institutions especially here in the U.S. and I think there's a lot of scope to be able to provide um, more of those services and understand how to do more of that in a way that really equips couples to be the best versions of themselves and down there are the best parents and, and really just the idea that this type of work is fundamental to creating the strong connected societies that I think anyone, everyone flourishes in. So that's a little bit about me. We're gonna start with a, um, case synopsis, and I'm going to be very boring and just read it to you. So Nikhil is a 28-year-old Hindu Indian American male who's in a serious relationship with Amy, a 26-year-old white Catholic American woman. He's thinking about proposing to Amy, but is worried that his parents won't be accepting of his relationship. In the conversations he's had, he's been perplexed by their insistence that they that he date Hindu Indian American women, given that he felt that his parents didn't raise him in a particularly religious fashion. He rarely went to the temple, didn't read a lot of religious texts, or talk about faith beyond celebrating Holi and Diwali. He's very close to his parents and hesitant that a therapist will encourage him to put up boundaries with his family if he shares that they aren't accepting of his relationship. He's unsure of how to navigate the conversations he wants to have with Amy about his religious identity and with his parents and siblings about how important Amy is to him. The worry and preoccupation are negatively impacting his concentration and ability to complete tasks at work. The rumination is also leading to several hours of initial insomnia at night, which is having an impact on his ability to eat, exercise, and be present in his relationships. Um, so when we start to conceptualize this case, uh, we got a really beautiful analogy, of course, from Vineeth of the chariot and the charioteer. And so we could really, from a Hindu spiritual care lens, particularly, we can think of Nikhil as having a dharmsankat, a moral dilemma that can be resolved. He can have his path illuminated as he unpacks what is important to him and why it is important to him. And, you know, you can, again, think of both of the charioteer as 
a chaplain and helping him see everything that he needs to see to understand what he wants to do. But you can also um, see the charioteer would then kill himself in trying to navigate understanding really at the fundamental root of it if the dilemma is between like do I honor what my parents are asking me asking of me and their expectations due to my understanding of my dharma um, my duty to my parents or um do I see it as I have a duty to myself and a duty to my girlfriend to be able to honor that, that relationship and those needs as well? And what is, you know, kind of right or wrong for me as I, as I navigate this? Um, but if we move to thinking about this in more psychological terms, we can start with the psychodynamic conceptualization because that's how I've been trained. But there's a lot of different pieces to how you could think of a psychologist really approaching um, Nikhil's case, right? So of course it would start with getting a lot more information than we would probably get in the case synopsis. But when we say object relations, right, that's really understanding how did Nikhil grow up relating to his parents and how has that now impacted how he relates to others, namely Amy, right? Is there a sense of a really secure attachment to both? And so he is able to be fair to himself in navigating this relationship or is there a history of being anxious or even avoidant of these relationships and is there pain around that that's manifesting now is even the decision to start dating Amy talk to Amy rooted in like Nikhil's own attraction or in a choice to um, push at some of his parents' expectations. Those are things that potentially could be explored if you're lo really looking at a lot of object relations or attachment work, right? And there's so many different layers of what you could do um, to really conceptualize what is going on with Nikhil and what he needs. We could talk about his defenses if he is suppressing anything or if he's actually really engaging in types of um, sublimation or projection or these ways of taking his feelings about potentially his parents or potentially about how he has been led to think about his Hindu identity and then um, using that to push and pull on his relationship with these two people that he's currently really feeling torn between. And if we can also like consider that another layer of conceptualization could be, um, I put personality pathology, but I think I should have just said personality structure, right? Not to overly pathologize Nikhil, but being able to understand like, is he structured in a um, histrionic way where he is looking for attention to feel really validated and valued um, and is making choices that he thinks will push and pull um, members of his family or even Amy, right? Or is, it, is there um, some type of masochism where perhaps he's like really reading a lot into his ideas of what his parents will say, but they would actually be really accepting. And he's making this a lot more difficult than um, it may be because there's an orientation towards thinking that suffering makes us kind of be seen and be understood. So again, uh, in a psychodynamic conceptualization, there's a lot of ways to really look into the roots of how... Um, Nikhil is feeling and kind of bringing him to understand. I think that's, that's really what the goal of these conceptualizations is, is that as he builds insight into himself, then he will be able to decide 
what he wants to do going forward with a better understanding of the consequences and the uh, potential of that choice. So again, this comes from a place where you can think about, you know, his like very core brain structure being like the aid, the ego and the super ego, right? Where the aid is those really um, most base desires that we have, the super ego being formed by the society that we live in and being this moralizing force that pushes us to check, uh, you know, our id impulses and the ego always negotiating between the two. And that's interesting to, to think about that way of thinking and try to understand how this could correlate with uh, Hindu ways of thinking, Hindu um scripture where of course we have a lot of uh talk about how to deal with the ego right and of course we're using ego in a different way than um freud would or you know analysts would but um the core idea of kind of being able to think of grappling with like what exactly do we want what exactly are we being shaped to want and how do we navigate like what is most fair to us through that if that is um the psychodynamic conceptualization i'm thinking about how can you bring in the hindu idea of like okay we're gonna navigate um that but the ego is not just you but also connected to all of you and your divinity yeah and then if we if, if we're continuing to also think about it in a more cognitive behavioral sense coming from a psychological lens you know in a lot of ways there's a lot of different psychological orientations of course but uh, these can be two of the biggest ones in a lot of ways um and if we think about dynamic work as really trying to understand the root and using insight to to really empower the individual to to make changes indirectly then a cognitive behavioral approach is like well let's really look at the symptoms and let's really understand what is needed to achieve like more immediate relief uh because that is what will change um how we're thinking and how we're feeling about things so like you know we can look at a chain of like what are the antecedents to the behaviors to the consequences for nick hill um really understanding like okay let's let's let actually understand why you're not sleeping well because that in a lot of ways is impacting your work it's going to make it harder for you to talk to anyone even if you want to and it's going to really show up in a lot of the symptoms you're feeling so let's let's just break that down in of itself and give you relief immediately and of course we can find a lot of really hindu ways to to ground this type of work in of itself too right in terms of using meditative practices or other grounding practices in order to, in the moment, reduce our symptoms. And, you know, so how would, how would that look in action? There's so many different ways, right? Of course, starting with assessment, and I think it's really important that assessment is grounded in being able to understand what is Nikhil's connection to his spirituality, his religiosity, in addition to understanding his connection to his family, social life, et cetera. Um, a motivational interviewing approach, uh, like if you take that conceptualization and then use it to push Nikhil to really um, understand himself with these open questions and these questions and reflections that are really attenuating to like any change language and any uh, motivated language to understand what his path forward is. And, you know, if we're thinking more dynamically, then we're really thinking about how is he going to recognize the patterns he's in? How is he going to uncover his unconscious motivations? And how is he going to develop empathy for whatever place his uh, parents may be in to help him feel more grounded in his identity and also in how he wants to move forward? And then, you know, with CBT, then we may be doing a lot more 
um, skills building, behavioral activation, whether it's like, okay, let's start with some sleep hygiene, or it is like, okay, you want to figure out how to communicate. Like we can literally practice the words that you want to use um, to talk to them through all of these techniques. So I think the most interesting thing is, right, that we can talk about these differences in approaches in the integration by thinking of Hinduism as simply saying, seek the truth, interrogate the self, right? And a different understanding of the self um, than perhaps we're used to, but really the most, most essential self, the soul, if you will, and find transcendence. So to move beyond the body as a vehicle and feel connected to to all divinity. I know transcendence is not always um, the most Hindu word to use, but I think it's it's important here in that idea of feeling uh, connected to something bigger than us, right? And if psychology also says, seek truth, right? Understand and interrogate yourself to, you know, whether it's unconscious motivations or your um chains that you're trapped in, but find imminence, right? And I'm I'm thinking of imminence as find the alignment between like who you are and where you want to be and how you're going to get there, but feel aligned within yourself to find imminence. And then what is, what is the overlap is in the power of understanding ourself, right? And that's, that's the power of the potential integration here is if we're in a Hindu lens thinking of like, how do we find the alignment in our chariot to make sure that it is headed um, in the direction that we choose for it to go in or psychologically, like how do we bring our life in line with our values and make sure that we're making the decisions that reaffirm those values and, and help us uh, feel again that we understand ourselves in that way but then there's these differences right and that's where we can see um that's where we have an opportunity to talk about some of um what each approach is really good at right so I think it's fair to say that if we take a psychological approach when we're talking about someone who may address, be experiencing more severe symptoms or where the, the very insight-driven approach isn't accessible, um, it may be important. And that may also be a psychiatric approach too, right? Where we need to really engage in um, providing safety if someone is, uh, you know, experiencing suicidal ideation or if they're really suffering from almost you know catatonic symptoms of depression then medication may be really important and that's about integrating again that that sphere of care um but also a respect for like if a spiritual approach is is far more warranted and necessary than any psychological one because the presenting prob problem requires a respect and understanding of the value of transcendence or the idea that we have to be able to appreciate that sometimes the psychological approach is not without iatrogenic effects, right? And, and there are times when... Um, the power it has can also have side effects on how people are thinking about themselves and what they want. And I think what I mean by that, I can elaborate more here is that if we think about, okay, these are, these are two powerful approaches. They've helped many for a long time, but we were talking about integration and the and the power of that, right? So what is the criticism of isolated approaches? It's that when you talk about Hinduism, um, we may find that there's an inability to appreciate at times the pain and complexity of a misaligned mind in the challenges of finding well-being. So uh, 
you know, it's sometimes just easier to say you need to transcend, you need to stop identifying so much with your mind, stop identifying with your emotions, and then you'll find peace, like, you know, essentially, like, care less about this material world, which which is not always really accessible to a lot of people and not always appropriate, depending on um, what what their experience is. And then, of course, the criticism of a psychological approach, which I'm seeing um, more and more as I'm reading, right, is that sometimes historically, there's been an inability to appreciate the power of transcendence for well-being. Um, and I don't think this has to be true. And I think what I have appreciate about psychology is that it will grow as a field and it will hopefully respond to what we're seeing today, which is that um, sometimes perhaps the time taken to really understand ourselves and our emotion and our experience can take us away from having the power of kind of forgetting ourselves for a moment to connect with others and uh, really appreciating, like in our, our, again, digital world, that spending a lot of time thinking about ourselves and our experience can actually be uh, antithetical to our resilience. So I think being able to appreciate, um, again, that there can be side, side effects of therapy and that um, we have to be careful about making sure of when and when it's appropriate and when it's not are important. And uh, it was just another reason to think the isolated approaches um, are kind of fundamentally flawed. But, you know, Vineet shared this very beautiful quote with me that really epitomizes what I think of as I think of uh, integration. So I, it's from the Isha Upanishad, and I'd love to read it to you all. So in, the in the dark night live those for whom the world without alone is real. In night darker still for whom the world within alone is real. The first leads to a life of action, the second to a life of meditation. But those who combine action with meditation cross the sea of death through action and enter into immortality through the practice of meditation. So we have heard from the wise. In dark night live those for whom the Lord is transcendent only, in night darker still for whom he is imminent only. But those for whom he is transcendent and imminent cross the sea of death with the imminent and enter into immortality with the transcendent. So we have heard from the wise. So I think again, that's a beautiful way to bring together both the transcendent and the imminent. And um, there's, a, there's an opportunity again here to work together to understand first uh, what our approaches entail. Um, there's an opportunity to address, again, the criticism of isolated approaches. And I think fundamentally, I'd like to say that there's a there's an opportunity to take on a digital world that in some ways is designed to erode our well-being. Because you know, I've been reading um, a lot of Jonathan Haidt's work, and he, he is a self-professed uh, atheist, but talks about how um, we need we need more spirituality we need more connection because uh these are the things that really help inoculate us from depression and anxiety in a lot of ways and the, you know that doesn't mean asking everyone to turn to organized religion necessarily but there is um a power to understanding that we've kind of i think he puts it as we've evolved with these god-sized holes in our heart and whether you think it's because we were created that way or because you think that there's this like evolutionary value to being able to appreciate spirituality and connection, uh, there's a lot to respect to that approach. So I, I put together a couple of discussion questions um, for reflection 
but we'll wrap up here and again just thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to unpack a little bit of these perspectives Thanks so very much, Kavit. Uh, you have uh, <clears throat> given us a window to uh, spiritually integrated psychotherapy, <laughs> among other things, um, since the classic uh, book by uh, Ken Parliament um, in 2007, there have been a plethora of... of um, reflection on that. Thank you so very much. You have also illustrated this um, sacred art of charioteering to com to continue with the uh, with the analogy. Uh, but in terms of an integration that uh, doesn't confuse, that is really um, bringing together resources from our tradition, the wisdom tradition of Hinduism in your case, and the wisdom of the psychological psychotherapies in a way that is harmonious, uh, mutually illuminating, and for the sake of um, uh, psycho-spiritual care, which uh, I think you also demonstrated and uh, illustrated um, is uh, is leading in the wisdom path, shall we say? How shall we live well together as a couple, as a community, when all is said and done? So again, thank you so very very much. There is. And you have left it with a question there uh, for the breakout rooms. <clears throat> we'll move to that immediately. There is half an hour for time of uh, break and also conversation. <clears throat> we have that uh, question about uh, this case study and the whole issue of how this um, rich and actually also diverse Hindu tradition can help all of us or any of us to further um, three things, inspire um, and guidance and um, inform us, inform us, inspire us and guide us in some way and perhaps integrate with those in our own traditions. So we will um, stop here and uh, dig in the break rooms. Uh, <clears throat> let's say that there will be only up to six people, six of you, uh, and, and random will find together there and it's up to you the the agenda there we have the proposal that you uh, reflect on the question that Kavita presented um or the larger issue how what we have heard of the Hindu contribution um and how that resonate with our own and insight that we find particularly helpful, but it, you may also have a concern, a question, uh, you can write that in the chat and it will be, um, it will reach the presenters now and, and the rest of the, uh, of the symposium. Um, so um, let's enjoy a time of uh, uh, rest and conversation. And we'll be back in half an hour.
presenters and uh, moderators <clears throat> will uh, have a chance to gather uh, as a group and we have the same flexibility uh, as uh, suggested for the rest of the people <clears throat> here. So, um, and, of, and of course, <laughs> we, you, <laughs> can take a, uh, the time you need for <laughs> uh, stand up or do. Yeah. I was just gonna. I was just anything gonna ask else you need to okay do. To, uh, Please, sure, sure, yeah, go ahead. So I, yeah. I, I just, I'll, I'll step away. Should we um, stay logged into Zoom, or should we leave and then come back into the the meeting? Uh, uh, right now, you mean? Yes. No, it's it's up to it's, no you. We uh, pre as presenters, you have the. The opportunity to to rest uh, and uh, or uh, we didn't schedule a time for a lot of interaction, assuming that um, um, uh, having all this time with presentations it will take a lot of time, but it's it's up to to each of you each of us. Mm -hmm. I'm I personally believe. interested in maintain uh, uh, Leah, Leah uh, Thomas. Um, I want to take uh, advantage of the opportunities. My colleague here, professor of um, pastoral care and um, and contextual education and um, uh, part of our local team. Leah, go ahead. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I, I I believe it's easier on our end if you stay logged into Zoom, um, even if you need to take a break, but um, not a problem if you need to leave. I get, and Steve Norton is really our IT person. He could probably speak to that as well. Steve? Okay. Yeah, I would say it's fine for you to just stay logged in here. You can turn your video off and then um, at uh, I believe 145 is when Judaism will start and you can just turn your, your video back on at that point. Um, and, uh, everybody will be back from the breakout rooms, uh, shortly before 145. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's 145, um, Easter time. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> right. Right. Wonderful. Okay. Lance, it's good to see you. Oops. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mars, I. If you can hear me, I don't think we have met. Are we connected? Uh, yes, I hear. Moz, if you would unmute yourself. I'm not sure that he's hearing what you're saying, Daniel. Yeah, for Moz, I ask whether uh, you would introduce yourself. Um, we can see you there in part of this conversation. Apparently, cannot hear me. So maybe it's it's okay to simply take the time to rest <laughs> and uh, include me. <laughs> and we'll return at 145 sharp, right, for the um, brief introduction of our um, Judaism represent. Correct.
Correct. And everybody is here, as far as I know. Um, of the presenters, yeah. Of the presenters. That is, yep. uh, that's crucial, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to stop the video. Lakini unaona ni wewe unaona Carlo.
Can I be sent back to the group with Professor Mombo? I was in the group of Professor Mombo. Thank you, Jane. Hello, yes, I will try and put you in with uh, Professor Mumbo. Thank you. I think that should do it. Yep, she's gone. I think she got dropped again, but she's having internet connections and keeps, she's not in the group, room one. She, she should be in room two. Oh, oh, there she is. I think she used to be in room one. No, I don't know. Okay. Um, Jeffrey Le Port, are you um, intended to be in a group or? And also Marvin Higgins. It should be in room three, but they're in the main room. Unless they want, just want to be here, I don't know. Um, and Deborah Adams in room six is not joined. I think they might have opted out of the breakout rooms. Perhaps. How do you put someone back in the breakout room if they've unjoined like Jeffrey and Marvin? If you click on the uh, breakout rooms mm -hmm. and then there's, it says rooms and then participants at the top. Uh -huh. And if you click on participants, you'll see everyone and you can move them then to a, a room. But but they're already in a room. But my moving them back to the same room will let them join. Oh. <laughs> that I don't know. <laughs> yes, Marlene, hi. I just wanted to ask you a question. Sure. So in my let me lower my hand just a minute here. So it's gone. When I'm sharing my presentation, is it possible for me to use the advanced setting where I just share a portion of it so I can see some of the notes in my own PowerPoint? That yes. I think, I think yes. So. I think I, that's okay. a setting, that'll be a setting on yeah. your uh, PowerPoint yeah. presentation. Yeah. yeah. So you should okay. be able to. Yeah, because I think Zoom has a tab where you can put advanced settings and then you can like make a dialogue box that only captures the slide. You can pick a window or you can put make a box. Yeah. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whatever, whatever you pick okay. is what's shared. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for putting this together. <laughs> uh, good to see you. Yeah. yeah. Sorry for <laughs> we we thought that everything was okay to get started, but we has a little glitch there. I and, mean, that's... Uh, but I'm so glad you are able to participate, Maria. Yeah. And um, yeah. I enjoyed, yeah. you know, your presentation. And then on Thursday, um, uh, Esther from Ghana mm -hmm. uh, 
they have in common that, uh, you know, from a Christian faith base and identity, uh, integrating, um, in your case, you know, the uh, insurrectionist mm -hmm. wisdom, or subversive mm -hmm. wisdom from the indigenous, and in her case, from Ghana. So, um, um, of course, we had to put this together uh, in yeah. in light of everybody's schedules. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I think there will be some interesting connection there. But of course, this is a good setting, but it's just, uh, um, in a sense, for some of us, uh, or you, the, the beginning of a uh, larger and deeper collaboration. So, so yeah, we're counting yeah. on, we're counting on that. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to that. And I, um, I, I'm actually really excited to hear what the breakout groups bring back right. to the conversation. That's brilliant. That's really great. Yeah. Well, one where one way or another we'll try to bring the feedback for mm -hmm. all the presenters to to keep in mind and then as yeah. you work with uh, for example in your case your essay in process now you um, having presented today and so forth but hopefully it will mm -hmm. be uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I look forward to collaborating with you. Actually, finally, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, it would be great. It would be great. Yeah, um, going back to uh, Cuba in November, I'll uh, see for Chaplin's uh, formation and this this thing sort of all pertain there. Um, I'll tell you more uh, okay. about it in case. In case you you can even join, yeah, I yeah. don't know whether that would be possible. But um, so here we are. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Moas, earlier I tried to uh, get in touch with you. I see your your face, uh, but um, can you hear? Apparently not. Yeah, we've tried to connect with him and he wasn't responding. Right. But it's interesting that it, apparently uh, Moss can see the, I assume, the, the screen. I hope so. <laughs> maybe not. I, that's, maybe that's part of the pro. I'm going to close the breakout rooms. Um, so that people have some time for a little bit of a break That's uh, and good. and no, when I mean, it, you can back I, it. yeah sorry yeah when no when i close them then everyone will just be um come back to the main room just so that you know um and when it's time at 145 to resume our session <clears throat> so um, daniel daniel you, you might go ahead. You might want to announce that this is just a break time until 145 when everyone comes back because everyone's going to come back to the main room. Yeah, I'll put that in the yeah. broadcast that will go to the, the breakout rooms. So. Cool. So, Steve, are you doing that then? Yes. Okay. Steve? Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Mona, I'm the next one up. <laughs> yes. Do you want me to just practice for a minute sharing the screen, make sure it comes up okay? If you would like to, that would be fine. Okay. Good. Great to see you, Mona. Oh, you too, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, willing to be part of this. Sure. Oh, good. It came up. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, well, thank you for this invitation. I'm, I'm blessed and honored to be part. It's great to see colleagues, friends from a society for intercultural, interreligious pastoral care and counseling, Pace, Frank, and Danny, and several others. Um, we'll continue the conversations and collaboration. <clears throat> Have the right time. Mm -hmm. Do you have the right?
Hello again, we are back for uh, continuing this uh, feast of uh, uh, contributions from wisdom, traditions, and spiritual care. <clears throat> there are two uh, voices that uh, will uh, help us reflect further on our topic and our concern with integrating wisdom traditions from ancient sources to the present and from a modern uh, social science, um, especially clinical uh, wisdom. Um, representing that uh, rich uh, tradition of Judaism, two rabbis, um, Rabbi Mona Decker is a staff chaplain at Community Hospice and Palliative Care in Jacksonville, Florida. Mona's doctoral research is ongoing and is focusing on hospice chaplains' provision of spiritual care to persons with advanced dementia. Her research includes Jewish thought and other theologies that inform and support this spiritual caregiving practice. And Mona is also a visiting rabbi at First Congregation Sons of Israel in St. Augustine, Florida. There's more I can say about uh, Mona and then about uh, Rochelle Robbins, as I indicated at the beginning earlier today, um, you have a fuller bio in um, accessible. I'll just highlight a couple of uh, of um, notable uh, pieces of information. <clears throat> Rabbi Robbins serves as co-founder and president of the Esri Institute, a 21st century interreligious graduate program, and as an ACP certified educator at a Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles. <clears throat> Rochelle is recipient of numerous scholarships and awards. Uh, many I won't mention here. Uh, uh, and she has also published in the field of Jewish pastoral care, Jewish women's commentaries, intersectionality, and transdenominational Judaism. Rochelle is a certified educator with ACPE, and uh, we are delighted and very, very grateful to having both of you. So go ahead uh, as soon as you're ready. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let me get my, is my screen sharing up? Okay. Thank not you yet. so much. But not yet. Okay. Let's see, we had it up in a moment ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Here it is. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Yes. Good. Okay, great, great. Thank you, Daniel. It is a real privilege to participate in this symposium and I so appreciate this opportunity to learn and share together and to work with my colleague Rochelle Robbins. In the course of my ongoing dissertation research on the spiritual care of care receivers in hospice with advanced dementia who are minimally or non-communicative I became interested in the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber's concepts of I, it, and I, thou relational modes in his book, I and Thou. 
And I was also interested how these in how these concepts can inform spiritual care and practice. So today I'd like to share a bit about these two relational modes, I, it, and I, thou, and some aspects that are relevant to spiritual caregiving. The slide deck that I'm using is from a longer seminar. So in our short time together, I'll offer some highlights. And one caveat is that while Buber's work of certainly drawn from Jewish sources and has a foundation in Judaism, today's presentation, um, because Buber had such an influence on many other fields and in many other places, this presentation today is not about Judaism per se, but of course is grounded in, in uh, Jewish thought. Martin Buber was born in Vienna in 1878. Oops, sorry. And he died in Jerusalem in 1965. He was among the most influential 20th century Jewish philosophers, writers, and scholars. And 2023 was the 20 was the hundredth anniversary of his best known book, I and Thou. Before discussing these two modes of relationships in the book. It's important to note a defining experience in his young life that affected him profoundly and contributed to his writing about relational attitudes and, and mode, modes, relational modes. Uber had a significant loss around the age of four when his mother suddenly left the family for Russia. Her whereabouts were unknown for some time and Buber met her again on only one occasion 30 years later. According to Buber, the, count, the encounter was marked by anxiety and only reinforced the gulf between them, it is said. The experience for Buber shaped some of his key ideas about the loss of security and trust between people in personal relationships, and also in his thinking about communal relationships in the modern world. And the conditions that affect one's ability to engage in relationships of genuine dialogue. He wrote, whatever I learned stemmed from that moment when I was four. Uber begins his uh, book by presenting two word pairs that formed the foundation of the book. I, it, and I, thou. Two relational attitudes characterizing one's relation to the world or even attitudes toward how we perceive, connect with, respond to, and communicate with others. Not only other people, but also in our connection to nature, aesthetic objects, the spiritual and the divine. He says, we relate and respond to life in ways that are either more objectifying in I, it modes of experience or more mutual and personal in I, thou encounters. So let me explain a little bit about both. The I, it mode is essential to engage in the activities, processes, and order of daily life. This is the mode that he uh, termed equips human life in Buber's words. The I, it relationship is essential for objectivity to conceptualize and analyze, to make sense of certain aspects of our perception. And we might think of this as the mode of rational thought, science and analysis. However, Buber's concern is that while the I, it mode is necessary to function in the world, it is insufficient in and of itself for wholeness and authentic uh, relationships in life. The I it mode has also been characterized as the realm of preconceived ideas and assumptions and expectations about others or even relating to others as a means to an end. The other dimension that Buber points to is the I thou mode, one that he believed can be cultivated and thereby improve the human condition. The I-thou connection is characterized 
uh, according to uh, a professor, I don't know if you can see this. This is um, Kenneth Kramer, who teaches at San Jose University and writes a book about practicing living dialogue. Um, I and thou practicing living dialogue. And he summarizes that these are interactions that are direct and open moments of mutual presence and, and reciprocity. When I address you as thou, I enter into a direct relationship with you as a uniquely whole person. This is a connection of whole person to whole person. Uber scholar Paul Mendez Flor explains that the I-thou relational mode is one of presence, trust, um, and care in which one addresses another, not just verbally, but existentially. Mendez Flor says the I-thou mode allows for a kind of trust and vulnerability, not simply hearing another, but listening, and listening between the lines beyond the verbal exchange. He calls this listening, he uses the term lehakshiv be'enayim or lehakshiv la'enayim, to listen to the eyes, meaning the visceral or the spiritual. And I thou also captures the nature of a relationship to God or the divine as a relationship of closeness and intimacy. Uber writes, in each I thou connection, there is a glimpse of the eternal thou, uh, and the eternal thou cannot be limited, contained, or reduced to the relational I-it mode. So the I-thou allows for a direct relationship for moments of reciprocity in relationships, um, and that in these connections, we can be intentional about entering them with others who reciprocate. It's also helpful to know that there is a fluidity in how we relate and communicate in both of these modes. Uh, they continuously interchange with one another and we can't expect them to take place in all relationships. In the course of my research about applying I and thou relationships to spiritual care, I was uh, inspired by a lecture uh, by uh, Abby Duchen, uh, Dr. Abby Duchen, who's a philosophy professor at Queens College. And she discusses Luber's I thou relationships and explains the, the philosophy in a way that can help us apply it to day to day life. And she poses a question using the I it mode um, as a, um, a reference point, since that's the world that we typically engage in. She says, in our relationships with others, in what way do we limit each other through our attitudes, our words, or expectations? Sometimes there is a tendency to have preconceived ideas or expectations about who the other is or should be, and we can make others into an image we have in our minds. But what, as one cultivates the I-thou relationship, one realizes that they need these relationships to become a true I, to become more whole. When I engage in an I-thou relationship, I rise to, my, to the level of my true I. In other words, I am better able to engage in and openly see you. And when I see you, thou, you, thou can make me a better I, and my better eye has a reciprocal connection in enabling me to say you or to say thou. Her questions prompted me to think about my own spiritual caregiving in my area of hospice work. And I think about how the I-thou relational mode applies to meeting people where they are and the value of presence in spiritual care. In his essay, Relating to the Sick and Dying, Rabbi Steve Moss uh, relates Buber's concept of I-thou relationships to the world work of spiritual caregiving. And he writes, accepting others where they are 
without negative judgment and with affirming love is an essential part of caring for the sick and dying and a manifestation of the I-Thou relationship. The I-Thou relationship in spiritual care conveys to the care receiver, I'm not here to make you in the image of myself, for after all, only God can do that. Rather, I am here to accept you for yourself, wherever and however that is. What the sick and dying need is a partner with them on their journey. And to be this partner is a great mitzvah, a commandment. Sometimes we define that as a deed of kindness as well. Probably the greatest gift we can offer someone else. I just want to jump down to um, another aspect of look applying I thou relationships to spiritual care. Um, I work with people uh, mostly who have uh, some form of dementia or related condition, and I was also inspired by the um, work of uh, a theologian and professor, John Swinton who wrote a book called Dementia, Living in the Memories of God. Um, and so I just think of this as one example in my own spiritual caregiving, um, where um, the, the I-Thou relationship um, comes in. Swinton discuss, discusses a concept called relational personhood. Um, and this is prevent, presented by another writer um, who wrote a great deal before he passed about dementia and dementia care. And Swinton says, Uber's central assertion is that relationship is primary. To be a person is to be addressed as thou, and thus personhood is primarily a relational concept that upholds people as relational beings. Our relationships of interconnectedness rather than one's cognitive or functional capacities or capabilities define personhood as we are persons in relationship throughout our lives. And while his um, ideas have been critiqued a bit, I think it is helpful to know, uh, at least it is helpful for me in, in hospice work um, and in my particular area of work um, that, uh, that in, when Swinton uh, claims that people with dementia are often treated in the I it mode of relationship. However, the I thou relational mode applies to an ethic of care that upholds personhood for people and ways of relating that sees them and seeks to be with them simply for who they are, apart from any capacities or capabilities that one may or may not have. And in this space of meeting, one does not try to conceptualize or analyze the other or determine what it is that makes the other different or otherwise. It is a place of true meeting. And so I try to carry those thoughts into my work um, and that idea into my work in my uh, spiritual care practice. Huber wrote, when we encounter another individual truly as a person, not as an object for use, we become fully human. And um, Buber's philosophy of I and thou is relevant to transcend barriers and create bridges of understanding, genuine connection of wholeness and goodness, person to person, heart to heart. One of the um, Jewish values uh, comes from the, our a text based in the Talmud that we read every day in our daily prayer book. And the text is, these are the obligations without measure, to visit the sick, console the bereaved, and perform acts of loving kindness. This is also one of Neshama, the Association of Jewish Chaplains, guiding values. I think Buber's work inspires us to consider how I it and I thou connections unfold and emerge in spiritual caregiving. How might we cultivate greater awareness about occasions for I thou connections 
as we visit the sick, console the bereaved, and perform acts of loving kindness? Or more broadly, how might we find opportunities to recognize I Thou connections in spiritual caregiving wherever we find ourselves and engage in these moments with greater intention? Thank you. Rochelle? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Marla had reminded us that our human vocation to be, to care for one another as the, the fundamental human vocation, right? And the practice of living dialogue um, can very well be one definition, another definition of, of spiritual care and uh, right. So communion, connectedness, and it's particularly significant that coming from you, we're working with folks, many of whom cannot communicate, and perhaps you cannot even be sure that they are understanding mm -hmm. this business about meaning making should not be the total definition of spirituality, right? There is a communion mm -hmm. that seems to transcend meaning, that, that is meaning in itself, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, well, um, again, thank you so very much. There's so much to, uh, to uh, process and uh, you have uh, been very, we are grateful for your generosity in doing so. And we we have a second wise rabbi among us, Rochelle, um, that will continue with uh, input for us to process. Well, oh, you don't see the right screen, do you? Um, Not yet. Okay, let's see. Am I, are we in good shape? Well, um, Rabbi Decker, Mona, I want to thank you for starting us off in such a thoughtful and beautiful and contemplative way. And uh, while Mona's presentation will, was about so many things, I don't want to reduce it. It was about so many things, but uh, you focused on Buber himself and his I Thou experience and philosophy with a glance at uh, serving patients and care seekers with dementia. Uh, my remarks today, I think, emphasize the I, thou, and sometimes the I, it experience in the education of chaplains. And uh, I enjoy seeing the slight smile or sparkle on Martin Buber's face, um, wondering what occurred between him and another to bring forth this forth from him. And I often assume that, um, I often assume what the smiles and facial expressions are around me, and perhaps we are good interpreters in our work, but Perhaps we are also making assumptions and studying Buber for the first time in many years. I wonder for those of us who interpret, assess and consider the stories we hear, whether we too can step back from our I, it assumptions to deeper questions um, and understandings and how to put the thou into spiritual assessments more strongly. And the act of assessment is essential in spiritual care but it is rarely uh, without some objectification or I it influence on the person being served. So though I'm not a jazz musician, um, this is Esperanza Spalding, by the way. Um, I encourage you to check her out if you're not familiar with her work. Um, I hope to riff or create a refrain and perhaps an elaboration about the chaplain in training. And as I said, we are always in training in my opinion 
we who are learning uh, to cultivate the I-Thou experience in our work and reflective practice. And my remarks are not systematic by any means. Um, they are more of a meandering and an exploration. And we often think of I-Thou as entirely about the other, but perhaps it's also about the other within. It can be difficult to be present with ourselves and not other within and from ourselves. And how do we cross this bridge from our surface self to our deeper self? The bridge from one side of ourselves to another benefits from a certain ability to be, I think, improvisational and curious and adventurous in our lives. And this can be unnerving, it can be scary, it's a bridge. And much of chaplaincy is improvisation. Living in Los Angeles, I think a lot of my students come from the entertainment industry and um, uh, one actor has disagreed with me when I said that CPE is an acting class. So um, much of chaplaincy is improvisation and curiosity and playfulness seem pertinent to experience in creating presence. So Buber studied and wrote quite a bit about uh, a rabbinical mystic, Rebbe Nachman of Bratzlab, who said, the whole world is a very narrow bridge, but the main thing, the essence of what is important is to have no fear. And having no fear is not an easy accomplishment. I wanna tell you all that I woke up, I was up from 1.30 a.m. to 4.30 a.m. this morning, worried about the world, worried about the wars, um, worried about domestic rhetoric and the fear that is occurring and wondering, what am I talking about Buber and this is for the you know sensitive people who want to grow and be enlightened. You know how how can we spread our movements of compassion? Um, so having no fear is not an easy accomplishment, and you know we can think of the world as it is now, like I just said, and the fear in the world and within us is palpable at times. And Buber himself, within a familial and ethno-religious and historical backdrop that was both privileged and turbulent spent much of his life, as Mona said, um, exploring the act or experience of true presence with one another as the most, the most tangible experience of sacredness in life. So Buber is probably the most quoted thinker by my Christian colleagues and friends right next to Henry Nouwen in the field of spiritual care. And Buber and Nouwen might be clamoring in our area, in our era to help us fix the wounds that separation is causing. And Buber, Nouwen too, they did share a, a brief period of life on this planet together. I think Buber was about 15 years, uh, 50 years older. Um, but they both, uh, Buber worked within the constructs of the modern world. Most of us here saw the postmodern era. And some now believe we are in this metamodern world that is characterized by technology and the digital era. And so we have access to each other. Look at all of us here um, through and by our fingertips. You know, we're so close and yet we're so far away from one another. And I, I can't tell, you know, I can't tell if you feel connected or disconnected from me or my words right now. And um, the same might be true if we were in the same physical space. Um, we live with this and we negotiate our lives through it. So chaplaincy education is centered in a relational attitude of connecting as, uh, as Rabbi Mona indicated in regard to Buberian thinking. Um, it is partially not exclusively about embracing people within their wounds, not despite their wounds, but within them. It connects with and is beyond polemics, it's beyond politics, it's beyond identity, it's beyond policy. Uh, these things are important, um, but uh, there are things that are beyond these topics. You know, it is remembering that we are, we are all flesh and blood. And as time progresses related to our consciousness building that resources in, on this planet are not infinite. And when I think about war, I also think about so many other um, things, uh, you know, in in re in relation to um, animate beings. So it's our resources are not infinite, and we begin to realize that we are connected to non-human nature, and the animate and inanimate elements around us, the 
objects of the world that we harvest, the things that sustain us. And so what about the objects and fundamentals of life that do not possess flesh and blood, but are essential to our survival? And I love this book, everybody, uh, Braiding Sweetgrass. Robin Wall Kimmerer in her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, offers an example of an indigenous and scientific perspective on the state of the world and the devastation and hope uh, therein. And her book is of the, the, uh, the pasture in the sense of meadow, field, or, or grass, not pasture this time, even though some of us would make correlations with that. Um, and I'm not sure we can talk about the I thou relationships in full if we don't consider the world that gives us breath and life, the world that serves us and the world that we are meant to serve, not only harvest, but meant to serve. Um, in spiritual care and education, for me, it is essential to insert non-human nature into the discussion and to name the all too often forgotten reality that our lives depend on this relationship too. What we see and view as uh, inanimacy or just mere objects also has life somewhere in there. Um, and this topic has not yet made its way into the national or international curricula for spiritual care. And, and I'm someone who, I'd like to keep it organic, no pun intended, but, but I'm not sure it shouldn't be added as something um, required. So the ayat mode of functioning has its place in the world, as Mona said. Um, and as Mona said, according to Buber, um, there is a place for observation, rationalization, and viewing and seeing an object in the world to exist within it. Uh, we miss hitting the boulder in the road as we're driving because it's an object that we see that is separate and potentially harmful to us. We see the ball and we kick it and the pen and paper are objects of creation and imagination. I would imagine in this Zoom room, the computer and the pen and paper are pretty important. When our work with care seekers, colleagues and students is based on outcome alone, we are merely transactional and therefore assumptive. What about the person's story, their joy, dreams, disappointments, and their heartbeat? This is all what we're about here. Um, and spiritual assessment and progress notes are essential in the medical world. And to substantiate our um, profession, at least here in the United States, to a degree, I, don't, I can't speak to it around the world. Um, many of you are experts in other places. And so there's value and honor to assessment and progress notes. Um, and at the same time, I found that it's important for me um, to always question my approaching the person being assessed um, as an object of my professional obligation. You know, I try to get in my own way when I'm merely becoming transactional for the sake of bureaucracy. Um, you know, and so how do we balance I, thou, and I, it just in the act of spiritual assessment? So to be, now, now I'm getting into the grammatical part, is an irregular verb. We know in our daily lives from, uh, we know in our daily lives that the act of being itself shifts and changes form according to the subject and tense of the expressed idea. It is not transactional in the same way other words are. Existence, I, I was thinking, it's existence is somewhere in between what we have been transcendently given and what we do with it in the here and now. So being existence is both this strange combination of it's both choice and beyond our choice. And we live when we are conscious of it. We exist when we are not conscious of it. Being is both involuntary and voluntary. Existing is therefore in and of itself an I, it, and an I, thou experience. It would be mere exhaustion to think about being alive at all times and to philosophize about that. Um, and it can also be a joy to say, you know, ah, I am, I, I'm alive and I'm present and I'm not even thinking about it extensively. It's just like, wow, I'm here. 
Um, and there are moments when we do, and, and when we do, there can be significant value to it. Um, so again, I go back to the I, it, I, thou, you know, what is happening in the Zoom room now as we are existing here together and all over the place, quite separately, together and separate at the same time. There are some word root questions of the ineffable name of God in Hebrew being connected to the word or the verb to be. And so I know this would be controversial for some. It's not for me. It's where I find a great deal of spirituality. Perhaps existence and presence are adequate definitions for naming the divine. I really strongly believe there is a foundation for this in, in Jewish text, life, law, and practice. When we exist together with no thing or task between us, perhaps heaven and earth are joined for a moment and for a number of us, many of our days, even in spiritual care, are overloaded with ta tasks uh, and bureaucracy. And um, we struggle and how are we able to teach presence with all of these demands? We do, it's not always easy. So yet joining and presence are not always easy or possible as we've talked. We miss each other sometimes by a centimeter or something vast, some huge gap, especially when we are in pain and suffering. That can be psychological pain or physical pain, whether we're conscious or subconscious of it. And pain often leaves us bereft of language and connection with others. And American English professor Elaine Scarry in her pioneering book, It's Not New, but I, I, it's, I highly recommend, it's called The Body in Pain, explores the language of pain and the place of ineffability in describing the depths of it. And Rabbi Dr. Rachel Adler writes in her Theology of Lament, she says, to be present when the sufferer reachieves relational speech is to be present at the rebirth of redemption. So how often are we present for the ineffable or the effable, I should say, redemption of those we serve and educate. And sometimes we're present with our students and care seekers. And at other times for one practical or psychological issue of our own, we miss the mark. And so I wonder about the difference between transcending pain and incorporating or integrating pain and trauma into our lives, which our Hindu uh, uh, colleagues spoke about earlier, this concept of transcendence. And I'm careful to offer people the option of not expecting transcendence actually, but um, working towards education and integration of um, their and our experiences. Maybe transcendence comes. I have grown to believe that psychosocial spiritual pain is much more difficult to heal from than healed physical pain. Old and open wounds might often come from a lack of connection, communication, inability to receive, and a perceived inability to, to serve others. And this idea might very well be evidenced by Kaiser Permanente's ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experiences, um, which is one of the largest research ventures that links adult medical issues, health and well being or lack thereof to traumatic formative experiences, namely abuse and neglect. This is happening all over the world for a variety of reasons. There is an imperative in our field to stay alert to the I thou experience of receiving someone's pain, but sometimes even for us who are trained to do so, it's just too much. Um, but when we do receive, suffering is often alleviated and pain is often managed. There are some interesting studies about pain management when people um, feel received. Maybe, probably not enough studies, there should probably be more. Um, maybe there's on our own, you know, maybe when we serve our own pain is also alleviated. We transform though we are still ourselves. We don't become different people, we become ourselves. And this is integration, not transcendence but maybe it can feel like transcendence, thereby, um, you know, perhaps um, many practical integrative experiences are, are indeed quite spiritual. Um, we can look up to the heavens and we do, and I do, but there's a practicality to spirituality um, in this sense as well. 
And so I close, um, I believe this is my last slide um, with uh, a couple of quotes and a story. And so um, taken uh, from a Hasidic narrative that uh, Buber himself quoted um, before his death, Rabbi Zusia said in the coming world, they will not ask me, why were you not Moses? They will ask me, why were you not Zusia? And to say a little more about this text, it tells us when Rabbi Zusia was on his deathbed, his students found him in uncontrollable tears. And they tried to comfort him by telling him that he was almost as wise as Moses and as kind as Abraham. So he was sure to be judged positively in the world to come. And he replied, when I pass from this world and appear before the heavenly tribunal, they won't ask me, Zeusia, why weren't you as wise as Moses or as kind as Abraham? Rather, they will ask me, Zeusia, why weren't you Zeusia? Why didn't I fulfill my potential? Why didn't I follow the path that could have been mine? So uh, it's no surprise that Buber quoted this Hasidic text, the I Thou experience is embedded in it and also the I thou and I it within, um, seeing oneself, holding oneself, seeing others, holding others as quintessentially themselves. And Martin Buber said, um, I do not accept any absolute formulas for living. No preconceived code can see ahead to everything that can happen in a human being's life. As we live, we grow and our beliefs change, they must change. It's kind of the opposite, um, as Mona and I were talking about, of idolatry, that things change. Um, so I think he said we should live with this constant discovery. We should be open to this adventure and heightened awareness of living. We should stake our whole existence on our willingness to explore and experience. And uh, this charge of Boobers, I think, speaks to a portion of why we're all here doing what we're doing healing what we are healing uh, with and for each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Rabbi Rochelle, for your presentation. Um, adding the question of the, where is the, the other located also within us? the question of uh, the bridge and the fear and the potential for hatred and um, alienation, etc. cetera. Um, there is so much uh, together with what uh, Rabbi Mona brought for us to, to ponder. We are a bit ahead of the time, believe it or not, but you you too, and the rest as well have been so disciplined in sticking to the time um, allotted. Uh, I wonder if uh, Mona and Rochelle, having read each other and having uh, uh, sort of uh, been in dialogue, um, if there is some uh, uh, you wish to add before before we go to the breakout rooms. Um, <clears throat> uh, you're not obligated to do so, but um, I realize you made a very special effort to stick to the time. <laughs> Are you asking them to do an I thou? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Um. There's, yeah, so. Um... I just wanted to offer as a um, a resource, <clears throat> if you're interested, uh, in 2023 in Haifa, there was a conference called Women Right Uber. And um, the idea was was that um, m most of the commentary on Buber or the writings of, you know, about Buber's concepts and philosophy, uh, you know, have been have been done traditionally by um, by male men. And um, so I think you can uh, find this online. Uh, some of the essays 
um, that were written. Um, and uh, the conference coordinator, a professor uh, in Germany, Yamima Haddad, uh, talked about how uh, Buber's ideas are 100 years later still very relevant in our world today um, concerning an ethic of care and our partnership in the world, partnerships in the world. And I think Rochelle's presentation really speaks to that as well. Maybe as associate with so many other things, um, the question of true self. I mean, why why were <laughs> not you, Susie, <laughs> and, um, Rabbi Rochelle Pacent, uh, and the the connection with the uh, potential, the revelatory potential, shall I say, <laughs> also in the I Thou relationships in our everyday life, but especially in spiritual care and how we um, who invariably will some forms of power in, in the caring relationship or in the supervisory relationship. Rochelle, you alluded to the question of education too. So how, how wonderfully um, and crucially important is to have that experience of communion connectedness in which there will be um, the kind of interaction that is truly potentially life-giving and even redemptive to use the photos very well in other words liberating from uh whatever we need to be liberated from, and also to um, build community. The, the <laughs> chaplain in training, and I'm talking about myself, even as an educator, um, while preparing, was highly aware of my younger self while working with Mona. Mona and I met when, when, we, were, when we were younger um, and in Philadelphia many years ago. Um, and more than once, and I, and that relationship, that those memories, um, just made me very well, very well aware of my former. Um, I still have much integration to to achieve, but a less integrated, and and I'll I'll just share a more uh, traumatized self, mm -hmm. and uh, working um, with Mona and reviewing Buber's work, work which I had not done for, for many years, um, was also a, a highly integrative experience for me. One in which I, I also went through some, you know, um, self critique mm -hmm. and self criticism, you know, regarding my own growth. And I, 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 I believe that the years and being able to incorporate uh, Mona on Buber and Buber himself more deeply um, has made me a, a gentler, kinder person, um, an educator and chaplain in training, really. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. On that confessional mode, Mona and I met several years ago and, <laughs> and still collaborate in connection with her doctoral project. So you have helped me immensely. Uh, also via um, Martin Buber, but yourself, of course, your caring self. It's, so, it's wonderful that we can continue the conversation in this different forum. Yeah. Actually, maybe this is a good setting. If somebody has a question or before we we have a breakout uh, room and and um, and time for rest prior to the final presentation of the day.
So let us then uh, move to a time of rest and then breakout uh, rooms where this uh, some of these issues can be uh, further processed, discussed um, in connection with your your own our own praxis um, wherever we engage in spiritual care across disciplines. And um, we can return in in uh, 25 minutes for then uh, uh, the final presentation and um, beginning to wrap up our session. Okay, we'll see each other later. <clears throat> What a gift, uh, Mona and Rochelle. I'm really uh, moved with, with your presentation. There is so much to to discuss. I wish we could go on and on, but we we will. I uh, I trust in the coming days. Um, yes, indeed. Thank you Hi, for Mona. the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you Hi, so Mona. much. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel and Rochelle. This has just been such a highlight and a wonderful opportunity to, you know, reconnect with Rochelle again. Um, you know, I too have been thinking about my early days in chaplaincy and, you know, still trying to integrate so much from that first unit of C <laughs> of CPE. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, it's just been you know, just a wonderful experience. And of course, Daniel, I'm so grateful to you to allow me to share a little bit of the research that I've been doing, uh, and, you know, on the theology section and uh, and to try to help solidify that for myself a little bit more as well as we go forward. And I just, I, I can't, I, it's so blessed to have you as as my advisor as well. It is already a, a contribution. It's going to be a contribution. We'll we'll see to it that it gets uh, published and and distributed. Uh, Mona, it, it it has to be. <laughs> so it's wonderful. Hi, Mona and Michelle. I'm I'm Leah Thomas. Um, I work at MBS. Um, Daniel was my predecessor here, and so I just wanted to thank both of you for your presentations. They're really thought. Thought producing, and I've, I'd love to have further conversation at some point. <laughs> They're really great. Thank you. Yeah, totally game. Totally game. Great. great. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, the idea is indeed uh, to uh, remain in contact from the association. We will be um, sending bulletin periodically and so forth. Uh, regarding the writing, um, uh, this is not the time to to have a lot of details. But uh, soon in October there will be an invitation that you you hopefully will <laughs> respond positively to, uh, and um, because this is an area that um, really. Um, has been flourishing on the one hand, spiritual care across disciplines um, in the so-called uh, professions, helping professions, but uh, that uh, this, this focus on integrating can be, it's, it's like a mine <laughs> that can be explored. And you and, and the other colleagues and um, look forward the next two days are bringing um, so much to uh, process and to um, work with. So 
Um, yeah. And you are you have make making been making a, a adjustment because of the time zone and um, <laughs> unfortunately yeah, for I don't know I, I mean uh, well you Rochelle especially in the <laughs> in California uh, together with Marlene Marlene uh, <clears throat> but um, um, we'll see to it that you the, the material is available to to you, the, the rest of the material, if you cannot um, uh, participate uh, in real time with the rest. Um, oh, that's great. That's great. I did want to see some others that I that I'm not able to attend. So that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we accommodated the schedule for people, especially in Europe uh, and Africa, and. Um, Ideally, we could have had all the sessions in the afternoon for mm -hmm. for the Eastern time. So, but uh, this is uh, this is still um, okay. <laughs> and uh, it's amazing yeah, no, what you put I, together. Go ahead, Michelle. Sorry. Oh yeah. No, <laughs> I'm sorry. You go ahead. No, I was just going to say. I think it is just amazing how you all have how you and your group, you know, your associates have coordinated all of this. I know that it's a tremendous amount of administrative work and coordination and and uh, connection with lots of people across, you know, different places. And as you mentioned, time zones, this is a really wonderful opportunity. Yeah, for all of us, it's a, it, it's a real blessing, the best sense of the term to, uh, to be during these times of so much um, need for mm -hmm. care with justice, care and justice, mercy and truth, right? <laughs> they like the psalm mm -hmm. <laughs> and mercy and truth and peace and justice, kiss if possible. Mm -hmm. Is that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and and we have a modest and yet invaluable opportunity to be part of this. It's just remarkable. And um, mm -hmm. even uh, Rochelle, Rochelle, you were talking about the unexpected and also, of course, the unwelcome <laughs> uh, situations we face of so much trauma, so much violence. Leah uh, has done quite a bit of work on trauma, by the way, mm. here and, and spiritual care, and uh, it's, it's, it's mm. indispensable. Yeah, I actually had a question, and you don't need to answer this now, um, but you were kind of, when you said psycho-spiritual pain, you feel like that's in some ways more difficult to heal than physical, and I was wondering if you had thought about the interrelationship between the two, that... well. Oh, absolutely. And I've experienced it. Um, yeah. yeah. But but I think um, what I really meant is healed physical pain doesn't wow. stick in the way that psychological pain um, or or past events. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, yeah. But absolutely, they're interrelated and related to spiritual distress and um, relational distress. And have you, um, it sounds like you've you um, have put a lot of your own um, energies and interests into this area. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the, one of the things I, I study is, well, particularly embodiment in caregiving and, um, and centering embodiment and how, how bodies speak um, and how they speak uh, and, and in terms of our psychological narratives are spiritual how they how that sort of gets embodied and shows up in our bodies so that's mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm kind of studying oh, interesting. yeah yeah um and so then what methods do we have for um well at least like being attentive to that reality in the midst of our caregiving like the ways that bodies are also speaking of past and you know yes past traumas pain, psychological and spiritual, but even positive events, right? They hold that as well. So, um, so yeah, that's part of what I'm 
what's fat, what's holding my interest these days. So. Very important, uh, very important work. Um, Thanks. Yeah. It's also another area that gets sort of lost in the shuffle. Somebody who has been here online, um, I, I won't out that person, but really um, taught me um, as one of my students years ago that when I would ask about her emotions, she said, I don't respond to that, but I can tell you where I feel something in my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was really, um, that really mm -hmm. stood out and led to body keeps the score for me and waking the tiger. And so I would be interested in the literature that you mm -hmm. draw from and, and perhaps write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Want to, um, excuse me, I just want to jump in. Yeah, hi, Vanit. I'm sorry I didn't get to, a chance to introduce myself. I'm Leah. Leah, <laughs> thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. And and Mona and and uh, <laughs> Rochelle, thank you. Um, I was attending, although I had to kind of keep my camera off at certain points. But uh, yeah, very very um, enlightening, important, but also challenging in many ways. And I don't know if there's scope for it you know, in terms of the literature that's produced from here or in another way. But I'm also fascinated by, and as you could probably tell um, from aspects of my presentation, you know, there's the idea of embodiment in our different traditions, how embodiment is, is contextualized, um, mm -hmm. you know, both positive and negative associations with embodiment, right? In, and and I'm, I'm curious, uh, I know Monica's not with us here, but I've had some conversations with Monica Sanford, who I think is presenting um, maybe tomorrow. Uh, but in terms of like Bud Buddhistic and, and Hindu kind of conceptions of embodiment as the crux of the problem, or, you know, perhaps I, I would say misidentification um, or over identification with the body as the crux of the problem. And yeah, it's just, I, 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 I think there's lots of room there to talk about how sometimes that gets overemphasized, underemphasized, um, you know, are these places that, you know, we're, we're essentially talking about the same things, but using different language, or are there actually fundamental sort of dissonances and, and disagreements in terms of how our traditions um, look at that? But I, I wanted to stand, I don't know how, you know, clearly or not it came across in in, in, in my use of the chariot analogy, but one of the things I've really come to love about that analogy is for me, it's helped me to reclaim the idea of alignment between body, mind, spirit, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, mutually exclusive, like, like I am the spirit, I'm not the body, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's for me, it's, although my tradition can often speak in a certain way that sort of, you know, can, can actually take that form of, of, of speaking in, in negation of the body, right? Um, I, I sort of reinterpret that. And in my work, I try to, to kind of translate that as a, we are, we are more than merely our body, right? That, that um, we are embodied beings. And at the same time, um, we can step out of that embodiment and witness it. And, and I like to even push further and say, you can't really care for something until you can actually witness it, right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. what does it look like if I can practice stepping outside of my body-mind complex enough to look at it the way I would look at a friend who's in need of care? Mm -hmm. right? it's, yeah. it's the, it's the mm -hmm. I, thou, the other, like it's, it's <clears throat> right, it's the relationality, if I'm understanding correctly, that allows me to yeah. be present and accompany the other. What if I could, through contemplative practices and, and in other ways, what if I could learn to do that for, for myself as well? Mm -hmm. I think that requires a healthy sort of stepping outside of, of our embodiment. Anyway, I'm, I'm saying a lot of stuff, but, but I think you get the gist of where I feel like there's a mm -hmm. real rich area to, to explore that. To my, to my knowledge uh, and in my reading, I haven't really come across this kind of engagement. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Those are such great questions. And um, yeah, I was struck by your presentation too, 
um, I, I liked how you sort of retrieved <laughs> in, sen in a sense embodiment with your charioteal analogy. Um, and, um, and I was curious um, because I had heard, um, you know, kind of more of a separation, um, like, or more of an emphasis on separation. Like I am not my body. I need to sort of rise above it. And that, that can happen in Christianity too, mm -hmm. right? A sense that the body is associated with sinfulness. Um, and so we need to actually distance ourselves from the body, overcome the body for spirituality. So there's, there's parallels there. And so, um, anyway, I think you're asking some really fascinating questions and I, I would hope that I'd love that for there to be space to, to engage with some of this mm -hmm. for, there, for sure. Yeah. I would think it's something similar, but in the sense that, uh, each of us here and and elsewhere in this symposium represent a certain tradition, which is itself plural. I mean, there are diverse Christian. Yes. <laughs> and frankly, um, I'm sure Leo we, we uh, the, in in the Christian tradition, um, we would say, unfortunately, normatively speaking, there has been this this difficulty with embodiment and and uh, but which is um particularly problematic theologically think about it. <laughs> if the divine um, is ironic in, is in flesh <laughs> yeah among us how right. can we not <laughs> anyway um that's for the internal conversation also and sometimes with difficulty um and so it's wonderful when it often outside it's outside our specific traditions narrowly viewed where we find not just common ground um say theologically or philosophically but a real summons to collaboration with joy, with joy and hope. <laughs> oh boy, that is one. <laughs> That's what I'm here to be honest with you, because what I draw and have been drawing from uh, people like you and many others for several years now. So this is just to be celebrated as well, even as we are also critical in a, may I say, redemptive sort of way, conf redemptively confrontational <laughs> at points for the sake of finding truth together in a process in which we are all transformed one way or another. <clears throat> it's nice to meet all of you. I want to Thank you. I think Steve, you may have a an announcement about when we're returning uh, the books. The uh, we're returning at three to plenary, right? Instead, Correct. So yes, the indigenous wisdom uh, tradition will start at three o'clock um, for everybody, and I put that in the chat for the people who are in the breakout room, so they are. They know about that. Um, and just to let everybody who was in the, the main room here know uh, that at three o'clock, we will start uh, with the indigenous wisdom tradition.
Dear colleagues and friends, we are ready to uh, come back to plenary session. We're a little bit ahead of schedule and um, we would like to take advantage of the opportunity to so uh, to use our time uh, well or continue to doing so. I'm uh, delighted to present uh, Dr. Marlene <clears throat> Ferreras, who is Professor of Practical Theology La Sierra University. Marlene is an ordained minister in the Seventh-day Adventist Christian denomination. Her areas of study and practical engagement include pastoral counseling and spiritually, inter spiritually integrative psychotherapy, Mesoamerican spirituality, marital and family therapy, and Latin theology. Uh, Malin is also a um, member of the executive committee of the co-sponsoring association, the Society for Intercultural Pastoral Care and Counseling. And um, I also want to add that recently Marlene won the National Hispanic Theological Initiative Book Prize with her text, Insurrectionist Wisdoms Toward a North American Indigenous Pastoral Theology. So Marlene, <clears throat> we're uh, very happy to have you here uh, with us at the symposium. Thank you. I'm delighted to be with you all and have already um, just had so much um, to think about with the previous um, presenters and just so grateful for this space and for this time together. My presentation today is going to begin with locating myself as a caregiver and a practical theologian, some of which is captured in um, the generous introduction that Daniel gave and in the biography online. Um, but then I'm going to briefly discuss some key tenets and insights of an insurrectionist wisdom tradition, um, which I talk about in my book, and I'll tell you a little more about that before I turn to looking at a case study in a verbatim where I'm hoping to spend most of our time and also engaging you in reflecting on that same case study and um, verbatim. Um, I'm gonna actually, at the end of my presentation, give you a handout so that you have the case synopsis and the verbatim for your discussion in the breakout rooms. So the caregiving conversation that I'm gonna pull from the book is gonna focus attention on women's identity as primeramente madre, um, first and foremost, primary mother. And then in the end, when I do the integration of norms, I'm going to reflect on the caregiving encounter by drawing on an insurrectionist wisdom tradition and also humanistic psychology. So I need to begin by first locating myself relative to the indigenous wisdom tradition because I don't belong to the indigenous community that I'm presenting on today. I came to learn about Maya wisdom tradition in Yucatan, Mexico through practical theological field research that I did for my doctoral dissertation and then that developed later into the monograph. A little bit about who I am and what um, brings me to this work, right? Um, I was raised by a single parent mother and I'm the first born daughter of Cuban refugees. You'll see a photo of my mother there on the bottom left with my grandmother who passed away a month after that photo was taken in January, 2017. And I'm named after the woman on the top right after she's our neighbor in Cuba after her daughter. I graduated um, at the same time that I became an adoptive mother to a Chinese daughter. 
um, born in China and has been, we've been living together as family for five years. And as you already heard mentioned, I'm ordained within the Christian Seventh-day Adventist tradition, and I was born into that faith tradition. The porch where my sister and I are sitting in, in the bottom right-hand corner, is our home, our family home in Cuba, and right next door to it is the Christian Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is how my family learned of um, that church and also um, Christian theology. That's how they came in contact with that faith community. So I recently published um, this book called Insurrectionist Wisdoms. And in it, what I do is that I use the image of Las Hijas de Maíz um, to describe caregiving. And what I'm doing is I'm not proposing a theory, but I'm doing a little bit more of what we've heard a lot about today. It's talking about this experiential approach to pastoral care and counseling. And in this one in particular, it's an approach to this experiential care and experience that is informed by working class Maya Mexicanas. So I'm inviting caregivers to consider indigenous epistemologies that practice corazonando, that's the Spanish, I'm going to be using Spanish and English too, corazonando or understanding life through their heart as a means to support women's ethical positions that challenge the values of neoliberal capital and by extension, its imperial spread. My aim in the research um, was not to pursue the quest, was, I'm sorry, was to pursue the question of how pastoral theology could attend to particular dimensions of women's identity and be infused with a responsible eschatological vision. Um, as a pastoral theologian and spiritual caregiver, I'm using the term eschatology as it's used in the literature of care and counseling to discuss the dimensions of a person's spirituality. So I'm speaking of eschatology as a longing, a desire, the possibility. It's what Will, Will James and Craig Dykstra call the more. I'm referring to this kind of understanding of eschatology as the negotiation of the configuration of present circumstances in order to open up possibilities of conservation, survival, and um, human flourishing. While living in the Pueblo that I studied, which goes by the pseudonym of Pueblo Magico, I noticed how women focused on a topological eschatology, a future that was emerging in the present moment. And this contrasted with the Christian Seventh-day Adventist patriarchal eschatological vision of a God is acting outside of time in control of an eschaton that only God could bring about and a human's dependent need on God. And so I recall as a kid um, fervently praying for God to return and to end our suffering. And I practiced what seemed, what felt to me like the only agency I had within that um, framework, and that was to be baptized into the community and to wait um, for God. And here, as I was in Pueblo Magico, I noticed that as women acted and discerned these risk-taking actions that might hopefully open up possibilities for what I recognize from my position as a more abundant life, there was a relational eschatology that attended to the well-being of plants, animals, land, and humans that was materialized. And this relational eschatology is based on a relational ontology. In Maya cosmology, there are sacred directional points and their energetic essences provide ontological orientations that acknowledge person's connections to the natural world and it assists them in navigating illness, suffering, doubt, or other of life's uncertainties. These sacred directional points carry with them energies and the heart, or what some of us might call like the self, is inseparable from the universe. It's embedded within these directions that also include Father Sky and Mother Earth. Healing is achieved by maintaining or restoring harmony and balance within the person 
and this includes the cosmos. Indigenous healing practices, they consider the multidimensionality of existence and they emphasize the active role of persons and their environment toward the healing journey. And while these energies have regional variations among practitioners of curanderismo, this is one way of describing the sacred directional essences um, that you see there on the slide. Mexicana sociologist and trained clinical psychologist of religion, Silvia Marcos identifies and she explains four core concepts in Mesoamerican epistemology that really help us to understand illness and healing. And they are fluidity, duality, symbolic representation, and proximity and similarity. Marcos constructs a framework for understanding the internal logic of illness and healing from this Mesoamerican cosmological perception, both from her ethnographic fieldwork with curanderas, um, healers, and the study of historical research of pre-Hispanic documents, such as Sagun's Historia de las Cosas de la Nueva España. My goal isn't really to explain each of these in detail, but I do want to highlight some unique features that in particular contrast with my own Western Christian North American cosmology, which is also the context, as you know, of most of the literature in pastoral care and counseling. So the body, right? The understanding of the body is the body is porous, right? So then the withering of the milpa, um, which is happening around this Pueblo Magico is also reflected in the dis-ease of women's bodies, right? There's this fluidity that's going back and forth between everything in the universe. Essential characteristic in Mesoamerican cosmology is the polarity of complementary opposites. So this is the idea of duality, right? At the beginning, the universe existed as a unified, undifferentiated whole. And this oneness gives way to duality. And there's a divine couple that represents two energies that define all the material world that we live in. And within these two energies exist many possibilities. And they're composed of varying amounts of each aspect. The divine couple is the one that gives birth to four sons who are the guardians of the four directions. And these four directions that were um, in the previous slide, as you recall, have energies and a spirit that can be called upon for the work of healing. In curanderos or curanderas, right, when they practice healing rituals, they draw on these. So in symbolic representation, right, there's also this um, knowledge of how illness takes on material forms so that then the immaterial illness can be transferred from one material object into another and then destroyed or burned um, and thrown away. Another um, thing that I think is really a really helpful backdrop for listening to women's accounts of their bodies deteriorating and their spirits um, failing or, or suffering is the Maya creation um, narrative. I don't have really time to recount the entire creation narrative, but what I do want to note is that in the Popol Vuh, Maya sacred texts, there is this direct link between humans and maize because the gods and the goddesses feed humans maize and this equips them to practice corazonando la vida or knowledge gained by feeling thinking through life. And the psycho-spiritual relational practice of feeding and eating maize from the earth is what results in the animation of humans in this creation narrative. And it gifts, it gives the gift to humans of what Ecuadorian anthropologist Patricio Guerrero Arias calls sabidurias insurgentes or insurrectionist wisdoms, the ability to maintain the values of community, of family, of solidarity, despite the challenges to do so given neoliberal colonialism. 
So let's move into um, a case study here, acknowledging that there are resources in the Pueblo for women to access care that can restore equilibrium and attend to the imbalance of energies. I'm presenting a caregiving conversation that demonstrates how a caregiver affirms a relational ontology and attends to women's identity as primeramente madre. This is the story of Veronica. Veronica is a 31-year-old Maya Mexicana born in Pueblo Magico where she and generations of her family have lived. Pueblo Magico is a small rural village located eight kilometers from a much larger town where a multinational corporation has established a textile company to mass produce garments. Veronica is married to Jose, who recently gained employment at the factory after his second daughter was born and the family's financial struggles to provide food and shelter for the family increased. The couple have two daughters, ages four and seven. They live in a na, an oval shaped structure made of adobe with a thatched roof with Jose's parents. Veronica is bilingual, her speaking her primary language Maya and Spanish. She was unable to attend school beyond the age of seven because her family was struggling financially and she explains to me that she cannot read. For the last 13 years, Veronica has worked on the assembly line of a textile company. She's paid on the number of garments that she completes each day. Her workday consists of 13 hour days with periodic days on which she is, air quotes, quote unquote, requested to work overtime. Those who elect not to work overtime, she tells me, are fired. She goes on to explain that at the time of employment, she's asked to sign a blank piece of paper and her supervisor uses this blank page with a signature to write above it a resignation letter with her signature on it. Her husband works both in the factory and on his milpa, the cornfield. With increased corn imports and subsidies, primarily from the United States, Jose is not able to make a profit from selling his corn. Although generations of the family lived from trading and selling the corn, the family has fallen into crushing debt and Veronica says that after Jose clocks out of work at the factory, he still goes to work on his milpa, and on some occasions, she and her daughters join him. Veronica says that feelings of depression wash over her periodically. She says she cries often. She struggles to make decisions. She worries constantly and describes her workplace as un infierno. That's a hell. She tells me of a time she took an entire bottle of aspirin after she explained to her daughters that they could not ask for milk that week because there was no money for milk. And this is an exchange between um, the two of us. Veronica says, I arrived to work and my sewing machine was not functioning. I'm not earning my daily quota and I don't have money to buy my daughter new shoes. When she tells me her shoes squeeze her toes and I see the open wound on her heel, I feel discouraged and cry. We're struggling to feed our daughters even with both of us working long hours. The caregiver practices silence and presence to witness the devastation of life and Veronica's cry for life. Veronica continues, I walked into the maquila today, me persigné, I did the sign of the cross for the blessing. And I said to myself, soy primeramente madre. I am first and foremost primarily mother. If I go to work, it's because so that my daughters will not lack anything for that and to improve myself a bit in economic matters and also improve my house because the first thing that happens in my mind when I get to work, I say, I already showed up. I make the sign of the cross. My God, help me that today will go well and nothing more. And my daughters first, I say. The caregiver responds, you are a mother first. What does that mean to you? Veronica replies, my daughters see me going to work. I tell them, I don't want this life for you. They see me angry. And I told them how I went to demand my sewing machine be repaired. I am not the problem. That machine doesn't work and the mechanic has not repaired my machine. The girls have seen me faint and with excruciating pain in my right shoulder. The caregiver replies, 
dealing with physical pain, an employer that doesn't pay you enough or repair your sewing machine is really challenging. You're taking action, which is risky. How is, how is what you're doing providing life for your daughters? To which she responds, when they saw me faint, I told them, it's the hellish conditions of my work in the factory. I don't want that for them. I tell them, el bebe que no llora no come, the baby that doesn't cry doesn't get fed. That's what my mother and my grandmother used to say. I've learned how to speak up for myself, fix my machine. If they fire me, I'll find something else to do. To discuss, I'm gonna synthesize or do some integration of norms. I'm gonna reflect on the verbatim using both Mesoamerican wisdom tradition and um, humanistic psychology. So Veronica's history of overdosing, stating that her daughters have seen her faint, stress from her workplace and economic strain to provide for her family might lead most psychotherapists and caregivers to begin with a risk and safety assessment. However, the caregiver does not assess suicidality and instead assesses the vitality through the affirmation of Veronica's identity as primeramente madre. By identifying as primeramente madre, Veronica is recovering duality as a theory in her cosmovision, and she is protecting the survival of her ancestors' philosophical background. Being a mother or practicing primeramente madre means finding a way to make present relationships fruitful. The primary concern is about what action needs to occur in order for familial bonds to deepen. The caregiver in this case, um, in this case study, begins by practicing presence and building relationship with Veronica. Similar to humanistic psychology, this is a person-centered, non-judgmental stance. However, the presence practice is enriched by understanding the caregiver encounter as a plática. In curanderismo, often the healing or the caregiving begins with a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. This is a deep listening practice that includes practicing empathy and attunement to what's going on. What's going on is not limited to the individual. What's going on includes the complex network of relationships present in the cosmos. The interdependency of all life is the ultimate concern and not so much a concern with how Veronica might reach her individual potential. The caregiver and Veronica are intuiting paths through the suffering in order to bring life to all that is around us. Maya creation myth especially emphasizes this ability of the hijas de maíz who have the ability to sentir saber, sentir pensar, the feeling thinking through life. This ability to perceive paths through suffering is that insurrectionist wisdom. In Veronica's context, discerning the possible paths to restoring harmony, balance, and equilibrium present many options. She could speak up, which she says she's done. She can refuse to work overtime, but in these choices, she knows she could be fired and lose the income that at present, most people in her pueblo see as the only reliable source of income. Since the agribusiness that once existed among the community is no longer able to compete in the market economy, the struggle for her and others is joining this maquila, this multinational assembly line work, without being deceived into believing that the way to live is to compete and to gain capital. In this system, she's separated from her community, and this separation, I would argue, is strategic. Veronica is cut off from all forms of relationality. The strong ties that connect her to the land, her community, her children, her spouse, and even her comadres, who ostensibly work alongside her, are severed when she takes her place on the assembly line. She is alone, forced to assume a role as an individual with but one task on the assembly line without a communal context of how she and her work is part of the larger operation of the assembly line. Veronica is deprived by the maquila, the multinational corporation, of the ability to judge and consequently normalize her experience with respect to that of others. This is a form of social control that forces her to submit to the maquila without the threat that she might question if the maquila bosses are violating some moral standard. It becomes important to hear how she's in relationship to all that surrounds her. And as primera 
mente madre, Veronica is emphasizing her identity as life giver, one who brings forth life and protects the survival of her children. She's living in this struggle and teaching her daughters to navigate complex structural relationships with wisdom. She's not concerned about being fired. She's, not con she's much more concerned with collective matters, workers' rights violations, and the livelihood of her family. The power the maquila system holds over Veronica does have its limits, and I think Veronica knows this. She has power over her labor. At present, the circumstances of her daily life are contingent on the maquila system, which is an extension of what was the hacienda and the encomienda system. I don't have time, unfortunately, to expand on this history, but what's relevant for the purpose of mentioning this historical connection is how suicidality figures an option for freedom in a slave system. The conversion of Veronica, the understanding and the knowing of herself as primeramente madre to essentially being a cog in the maquiladora system is an ontological assault on the theological claim that life is sacred. This practice is a negation of the claim that creation shares in the creative and generative labor of the divine. This is a complicated story, right? The Spanish colonizers imposed Christianity on the Maya through the encomienda system. When the encomienda system transformed into the privatized agribusiness of the hacienda, then the Maya were the indebted peones who worked the land. The modern day maquila repeats this tragic story. And in my book, I discuss how the maquila invades foreign land, turns them into machines, by making them little more than cogs in the production of goods, incarcerates them um, and subjects them to a context where they internalize the voice of the oppressor through self-surveillance, all the while the laborer's life is being threatened and their autonomy is being eroded. The spiritual caregiver who focuses on assessing the risks for suicide and creating a safety plan in my view, misses the spirituality that undergirds Veronica's suicide attempt. And just to, as a side note, many of these stories live in the Pueblo. In Western contexts where I currently practice care, self-destruction is stigmatized and discouraged. Assessment is intended to guide care providers' responses that range from suicide contracts describing steps the care seeker will take to regularly check in with the caregiver to increase visits with the care provider or in some cases involuntary hospitalization. The purpose of assessment and these interventions is to prevent the successful completion of suicide. However, there are other aspects of suicide to consider that are informed by Maya cosmology. Ishtab, the Maya goddess associated with suicide is depict depicted in the Dresden Codex with her head hanging by a noose. She is the deity whose responsibility it is to journey with people to a paradise or heavenly location, a celestial realm. Viewing death as part of a life cycle and the compassionate accompaniment of Ishtab, Veronica's attempt and consideration of ending her life must be understood in this context. Though she's referring to a method of death different from hanging, it's important to note that many stories of suicide attempts in her pueblo and Many others um, also choose to hang themselves or, like her, select a method that does not distort body. It's important to understand how suicide in this context is exercising agency and maintaining a relationship with community. When the possibility and the potential for life is contingent on systems such as the maquiladora, the laborer maintains absolute power over one thing, their own life. In self-destruction and suicidal ideation, the labor exercises power that compel the maquiladora system to reconsider the material conditions of the labor which lead her to taking decisive action. There is not an endless supply of labor and the operation of the system is threatened if there are less workers on the assembly line. Cuban historian um, Luis Perez highlights the practice of suicide in Cuba by African slaves who often use the method of hanging. He quotes Jose Antonio Saco, who explains many African slaves, this is 
quote unquote, um, many African slaves committed suicide not for the purpose of killing themselves, but rather to live. For they believe that in committing suicide, they return to their land to enjoy life once again. End quote. Perez underscores how slaveholders' Catholicism introduced views of suicide that contradicted and might deter slaves from the practice. Suicide in Catholicism is viewed as murder. The consequences of such an action were the condemnation of the soul to eternal torment, discouraging slaves, I want to underscore, discouraging them from self-destruction served to sustain the interest and the benefit of the slaveholder. And it's important for caregivers to note how creating a safety plan or suicide contract so quickly, as is the common practice in my own clinical context, it aligns with supporting and sustaining the suffering conditions if the conditions of life, meaning the system, are not also changed. Another aspect to note is that Veronica is not retreating into an afterlife where she will not suffer in order to protect her own interests. She may very well be relieving the economic strain on the family and community by taking the journey to an afterlife where she is still in relationship to her family. Her role in the underworld continues to be maintaining balance in the universe. Through ancestor veneration and being an intermediary between the spiritual and physical world, Veronica is actively seeking the well being of all creation. This view of suicide provides a framework that reframes suicide and might also help the bereaved in the mourning process. Suicide figures prominently in my family tree. Two months after arriving to the United States from Cuba, my grandfather was found with a noose around his neck hanging from a tree. I was told the circumstances that led him to this choice was not finding a job and providing a source of income for his family. He left my grandmother a widow with four daughters in the United States. A Christian minister told one of his daughters that sadly she would not see her father in eternity. And I wonder, how different might the suicide be experienced by the family if instead of the eternal damnation that was spoken upon us, the spiritual caregiver had noted how my grandfather was accompanied by the goddess to the afterlife where he would continue to work toward balance and harmony with us. Insurgents of epistemologies from the global south, such as the practices in Mesoamerican wisdom traditions, reject Western Christian hegemony by asserting the philosophical background, cosmovision, and caring practices of the ancestors. Spiritual care theory and practice can be further enriched by considering epistemologies from the global south. Marlene. <clears throat> You went there and witnessed something <laughs> that uh, contributed to change you, right? And now you give voice, you witnessed, you give testimony at people who, and culture with uh, suppressed and undervaluing voice, you're giving voice. That's a wonderful thing in and of itself, uh, in addition then to being illuminating for us. Um, the um, the potential for pastoral spiritual care and the one-on-one -on -one level, like in the case of Veronica and her family, on the one hand, uh, also illustrates the limitation in, in pastoral spiritual care within right uh, a system of oppression and exploitation. So hence the the um the dilemma and yet um also the promise and joining in the eschatological stance that you describe for us very clear. Thank you so very, mm -hmm. very much. Um we have the 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 final um uh, uh, breakout groups uh, again, um, randomly selected to ponder uh, this presentation 
and uh, feel free to also write in the chat. <clears throat> um, so that uh, Marlene can uh, sooner or later, but she will uh, have received the question and the concerns, and we will find ways to uh, continue the conversation. So we go to the um, breakout rooms and uh, time a break, and then return for the final uh, moments of today's uh, session. If I understand correctly, Steve, uh, people who, for some reason, are not in this breakout room can automatically be part of this join uh, um, space. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. If somebody uh, declines to join the breakout rooms, then they will automatically just come back here to the main, main room. And... Um, <clears throat> And you will tell us about uh, five minutes or so before four to return, right? Correct, correct. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Hi, I'm Leah. I teach Hi. at ABS. That was quite a presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah. You've given me a ton to think about. Um, do you go into this theory of suicidality in your book? <laughs> No, um, <laughs> and I laugh because you know what? There's two. I, one of the things I really appreciated by, from getting Daniel's letter is that it gave me permission to put it on my schedule so that I can, because there's several things, as you know, when you publish something, you're working on a project um, that you don't get to develop, and therefore the next thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this was the one, so I pulled it out, and I thought, oh, this is my opportunity. <laughs> And especially to get feedback from, um, I'm hoping, from the breakout groups, because hopefully it's provocative. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> my goodness. Well, um, I, well, I mean, and I can, you know, and I didn't go in it because it's kind of hard to do this in, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. But, um, I mean, in my own family of origin, like dealing with... Um, my grandfather's suicide was um, like, I can talk about just how traumatic it was um, and how much I don't think we were helped at all by um, spiritual care or even psychological sources that we grasped for. And while I was doing this work in the Pueblo, I, I think that's where I started to find threads of like, here's the healing. Like mm -hmm. there's another way, there's another way to understand mm -hmm. the loss of my grandfather, another way to connect with him, as opposed to in the, I don't know how much you know about Christian Seventh-day Adventists, but Seventh-day Adventists believe in the state of the dead where the body and the soul are so united, they cease to be. Mm -hmm. So it's complete cut off. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really significant. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I there's so I'm just thinking of so there's so much. <laughs> you just um there was there's so much, um I and I love the way you connected it to this sort of surrounding capitalistic system and how mm -hmm. <laughs> the the mm -hmm. sort of 
speaking against suicide being in favor of this capitalistic system who needs well, labor, right? Well, yeah. well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, when you when you look at who benefits, mm -hmm. which when you're talking about like context of exploitation, you have yep. to ask who benefits. Well, I get to choose who gets to benefit from my life, mm. right? Um, and and I get to also name what's taking what's taking it and rightly put that into its like there's multiple things that need to be addressed like I think it's just a lot more complex than yeah. putting it in a clinical a strictly clinical context where it's we need to prevent it mm -hmm. yeah yeah um, and and the underlying assumption of that model also being that life on this earth is of ult that is what is ultimate of ultimate value is the life yeah, that you're that's right it. Um, right, right. And not asking about the quality of that life or right. Like mm -hmm. none of that. And, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. no, no conception that life could be beyond this mm -hmm. and there could be connections. I mean, so all of that, right. Mm -hmm. like is absent mm -hmm. from that really kind of narrow clinical view. So anyway, it's just mm -hmm. a really thought provoking. Um, mm -hmm. I really appreciated it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that you, uh, this time uh, I, an association that came to me was uh, with this question about um, um, deep depression and, and mm. as uh, as a subversive act, so to speak, mm -hmm. <laughs> as yes. a protest, ultimate uh, ultimate yeah. protest. Yeah, and there is yes. something dialectically significant within a culture of death. Mm -hmm. What? Um, mm -hmm. Unamuno and Paulo Freire, mm -hmm. by the way, call necrophilic. Yeah. Love, I mean, died death loving somehow, life diminishing culture and consumerism and aggression, violence. I mean, we have in, in the United States, it's amazing, <laughs> obvious. Then Dying as a protest against mm -hmm. death mm -hmm. loving cultures has a kind of a dialectic mm -hmm. way of transforming. And and they uh, this is not death. This is not dying alone necessarily. Uh, I mean, there are many, many ways of uh so exciting right and uh yeah. this is not necessarily associated with guilt mm -hmm. i mean there's there's a lot there i mean mm -hmm. well this is what we are i think <laughs> with, with uh, <laughs> Liam here and <laughs> sort of um oh, inviting you to and mm -hmm. hoping you would continue to develop to, so that we can uh, we can learn more and better because I too for, for what I mean mm -hmm. was raised with this understanding of the utter sinfulness mm -hmm. yeah. of suicide I mean and then eventually <laughs> one learns <laughs> other other views and and um, and the mm -hmm. ultimate uh, sin, shall we say, is 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 mm -hmm. not loving, <laughs> basically, be unloving. Um, so anyway, there is a lot there, also theologically, yeah. to continue in mind. You, know, you mm -hmm. give us all this um, that seems to be very opportune time. In a sense, unfortunate, <laughs> and the other hand, yeah. very fortunate, yeah. <laughs> so that we can uh, resist caringly <laughs> mm -hmm. and embrace alternative wisdoms that help us reevaluate. Uh, in uh, in our case, frankly, and in, in the case of the three of us here, uh, of our own Christian uh, yeah. wisdoms and and. Yeah 
how they need to be transformed and for the sake of the um, greater value in caring justly in our case as caregivers and supervisors, teachers, it's uh, right, is that? Uh... Yeah. Mm -hmm. The way you teach psychology, the uh, pastoral counseling and care, pastoral care, then has been really uh, influence by this whole experience and such. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our structures in seminaries and CPE really need to <laughs> continue to be transformed mm -hmm. so that the plurality of the wisdom and especially the marginalized wisdom mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. had to be retrieved. So. Mm -hmm. Your voice is also prophetic, see. <laughs> what? <laughs> Your voice is also prophetic. <laughs> that sounds it. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Do you teach this? <laughs> in your classes <laughs> I'm just like grappling with like how would I <laughs> it's like we only spend a certain amount of time on suicide to begin with and I'm so <laughs> I know I know so I want to develop an entire course on it uh, you would almost you'll... need one yeah yeah I think you would need an entire course but I mean I I raise the questions I you know I devote like at least two weeks to it because I think it's really important but um no I don't I can't like dive into it in the way that I'd really love to yeah I think a course would be fantastic actually be really mm -hmm. really interesting and really good for people to yeah. to delve into this because you you need like time and space <laughs> kind of yeah 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 and uh, so I tried it a little bit lightly this last school year because I do teach a course on death and dying and of course we cover suicide and so that's where I have opportunity okay. to do that. Um, but we had um, a classmate's brother who was also a student at our campus but not in the classroom. Yeah, right? yeah. His, his brother was um, who um, shot himself in the young man's dorm um yeah. yeah and he took his brother's ashes and walked walked the camino um mm -hmm. and so we just sort of followed him on instagram mm -hmm. um but we've chatted mm -hmm. about it afterward and what's interesting is he had taken he had actually taken my class mm -hmm. two years before this incident and it was some of this discussion that came back up for him mm -hmm. um the way that it gave him a different framework than his Christian community um, yeah. approached it and and kind-hearted intentions within Christian community but it's not all of the pieces are there for sure um, yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah well one thing that I want my help is a, a comparative kind of study in the case of suicide. For example, in in a university like yours, where you know scriptural, say, Judas's suicide as a 
as a re resulting or connected with deep moral injury to mm -hmm. self. Uh, that, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a completely different kind of situation, isn't it? I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the aloneness, this is a guy who even repented, for goodness sake, but there was no community, there was no validation of his process. I mean, for example, uh, right, I mean, <laughs> and uh, so, uh, these these are different different situations. The the unfortunate um, look on Tuesday. I was I was last week mm -hmm. about to give a lecture for Paraguay. Uh, um, in university, and something happened a few hours before that, and an adolescent had suicided. Mm. And the class it was th that same day, and it the the the, the need for um, care in that um, in that situation was really overwhelming. Overwhelming. <clears throat> now this was a is a Christian community with the resources. A uh, fifteen-year-old um, uh, speaking of trauma, <laughs> Leah does a lot of work with that, um, mm -hmm. and um, so what is that? And then you we have older people, the developmental issues in 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 um, moral struggles depression um, or whatever else in in our different social contexts. Um, so I guess we continue to uh, to reiterating the, the value of what you brought. So thank you so very, very much again. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Grace. Thank you guys I'm, for the invitation. I'm very glad that we'll continue to be uh, in touch and we'll collaborate. Okay. <clears throat> so are we already back? I I'm, think it's almost. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to close the breakout rooms here. And then uh, I told the people that they'll be they'll come back to the main room and that we'll start the closing at 4 p.m. So in about seven minutes or so. Mm -hmm. So they will be coming in a moment. Yeah, one minute it looks like. <laughs> nice to meet you, Marlene. Likewise, likewise. Thank you. Dear colleagues, friends, we are back together after 
a few hours of um, focusing on this common concern of ours. Um, again, on behalf of oh, our board and our team here, we thank you for your participation, especially for those of you who presented and uh, offered the, the gift of wisdom, really, encapsulated so beautifully and in your own ways, all significant um, and have triggered further reflection, inspiration for us. <clears throat> We um, will continue tomorrow and Thursday, but with a different uh, schedule. So let's be careful with the timing. Um, I'm speaking to myself and, and uh, other friends I happen to know very well. <laughs> uh, it's easy for me to lose uh, touch in that way. <clears throat> um, we don't have special announcements at this point, except uh, the reminder <clears throat> that the recordings will be available for those who register. Many more than those present today uh, register. That tends to happen with uh, symposia and webinars for a number of reasons. Uh, and uh, you will have access to that and also to continue the conversation. On Thursday, towards the end of the three-day symposium, there will be a time of, um, to uh, give more information for the next steps and ways to remain connected. Um, so for now, now, I want to say farewell and may our whole self remain whole and able to uh, relate to one another and to uh, be preserved in a way that um, we can enjoy our lives and our vocations with much hope, joy, and especially love. May that be so. Until tomorrow.